Hello, my name is Hannah Lovelace. Members of the Howard County Council, I am here on behalf of all of the children of Howard County in order to make a better future for them and schools everywhere. Um, as I am sure you already know, this area is highly residential, and because of this, enrollment for schools also is very high. And from what I've seen alone, I can say that schools are being overcrowded. With the statistics, schools are reaching over 100% of their intended limit. Why have we let this happen? Surely we would be thinking of solutions, considering how unfair it is to, to children to be packed like sardines into their classrooms. But this has been an issue for a while now, and the only idea we have really put into effect was trailers. This is only supposed to be a temporary band-aid for the overcrowding, but the portables at my former elementary school have been, been there since the day I arrived for kindergarten. This is most definitely a sign that something needs to be done. I have been forced to walk outside and go into a cramped metal box, which is sure a fire hazard with lack of sprinklers for my math classes, orchestra lessons, and extracurricular activities, only because we have been cramming in student after student. Why should we continue to live like this? I speak for everyone when I say this isn't what we wanted for our school system, so let's think a little before we allow more students into the building and come up with more long-term solutions than portable classrooms. Since your control over school limits you from removing trailers, there are still plenty of methods that can, be, that can reduce overcrowding issues, like using better APFO standards. You may be tired of hearing that, but it is still necessary for making the situation better. For starters, regulating and testing high schools could be a very good idea, seeing as high schools are not being looked into at the moment. In conclusion, schools are a long way from being fixed, since we have let this problem sit for too long, but that doesn't mean we can't try to make it better. In the end, with better APFO standards, we can fix not only our schools, but our parks, libraries, police, roads, and all of the other infrastructure that needs improvement. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate and we love to have our students out, but please hold your applause. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Colleagues, any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Loveless. You have a good evening. <laughs> the uh, next student. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Kaylee Ramey. I'm a seventh grader at Mayfield Woods Middle School, and I'm extremely concerned with overcrowding in our schools, which is at least partially caused by building houses in areas where the schools are already over capacity. I don't think that a school is that if a school is filled to over 100% of its capacity, that it should be available to accept more students. When a school is at 100% of its capacity, I think that developers should not be allowed to build more houses. When I was in elementary school, I saw for myself how difficult it is to be at a school that is over capacity. My classmates and I did not like having to go outside in all different weathers to get to over six of our classes that were held in portables. Having so many portables also proved a problem of placing teachers. It wasn't fair to place the same teachers in portables year after year, but some classes were easier to hold outside. I remember that both the full and part-time music teachers were consistently in portables. One year, one of the music teachers did get an inside room. This would have been great, except that then it forced the band and orchestra room to be relocated into a different room, and that room was barely large enough to serve as an office. Needless to say, we didn't all fit in there, and I distinctly remember having to play our instruments on the stage in the cafeteria twice a week, while the other grades were eating their lunches because there wasn't enough room anywhere else in the school for us to practice. I also remember that when I was in first grade, there were so many kids that besides the four classrooms connected to the grade level pod, there were two auxiliary classrooms, as well as an almost 30 kid class in another tiny room. This room is called a resource room, which is, there's one connected to each pod. It was never meant to be used as a classroom on a regular basis, but it had to be used as a class because there were so many kids and not enough space. In conclusion, I would like the County Council to seriously consider changing the APFO legislations to restrict new building when elementary, middle, and high schools are over 100% of their capacity. It is not right to put our teachers, students, parents, and other community members through this when there is something that we can do to change it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ramey. Appreciate that. Any questions, colleagues? Thank you. Come on down. Thank you very much. Miss, and before you start, Miss Phil, mark the clock is doing all right. We have a little it bit. It is going in chunks, but it's going is in going. chunks. So just uh, <laughs> if so, people who come up to testify, you'll note that it's le it's de decrementing it. Well, now it's just doing all sorts of things. Um, it's mostly decrementing in five and four second chunks. 
uh, but it is accurate in terms of its timing. So, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Piper Hermitson. I am eight years old, and I am in third grade at Manor Woods Elementary School. I have 28 kids in my class, and I think that is too many. It is really loud in my classroom. My teacher is great, but I think, but when I need help with something, I don't always get the attention I need because others need help too. My class is in half of a room, which is in a re regular classroom. I like having a little personal space, and with so many kids, I don't have any. This summer, they put lots of portables outside in the school. Now, during recess, we can only play on one quarter of the field instead of the whole thing because the recess monitors have to be able to see us, and the portables block their view. When I go to music, I have to leave the building and wait outside on a ramp for one class to leave the portable so we can go in. Sometimes it is raining and we have to stand out in the rain and get wet. When we are in the portable, we are not allowed to get a drink of water or use the bathroom, so we have to wait. When we go to school for special things at night, even if we get there really, really early, there's nowhere to park. There's not enough space in my school, and that, and it makes me feel sad. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Hermanson. Any any questions, colleagues? Yeah. Uh, I do one quick question. That is, what what is your favorite subject in school? Um, probably reading. Very good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. It takes a lot to come out and testify in any fashion. The three students who just did, thank you very much for, for coming out and doing it. Thank you, Ms. Hermanson. Pretty good. Shift our attention now to uh, CB 61, 62, uh, which we will hear as we did last time, hear them together. We're off here. All right, so uh, we'll just start actually uh, uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Valancourt, uh, John Liao, uh, Annie Hader Shaw, Catherine Maylander, and Cole Schnorf. Again, folks, as I call your names, if you can please come to the uh, come to the chairs in the front. And after Ms. Valancourt, we have John Liao, Annie Hader Shaw, Catherine Maylander, and Cole Schnorf. Good evening. Okay, so now about this mulch thing. Yeah. Yeah, done. Sorry, we're done with that. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Valancourt, Chairman of the Howard County Board of Education. I appreciate this opportunity to represent the board and the school system on the adequate public facilities ordinance and to advocate for education of our county's 56,000 public school students. Our county is one of the fastest growing school systems in Maryland. The Howard County Public School System expects to welcome approximately 9,800 additional students over the next 10 years. The time is ripe for an amendment that updates the APFO to match Howard County development and population conditions so we can provide adequate schools and facilities for our families. In light of these trends, the HCPSS Board of Education submits the attached resolution of recommendations for the APFO amendment. Notable changes to the ordinance that we're requesting include adding the high school level to the school's test, requiring all development to pass a school's test, maintaining the current open-close designation language, defining open-close chart capacity utilization at 100 percent, including a funding trigger for school facilities at 95 percent with a when they have a projection of more than 110 percent in five years, and defining APFO capacity consistently with HCPSS policies. As Board of Education Chairman, I am humbled by the level of commitment and concern for the welfare of every child shown by our government. Our system greatly values the strong support shown by our representatives for our schools and students. I urge you to continue to express your commitment to our children through your support of these recommendations. 
and oh, I have a lot of time left. So um, one thing that I have I continue to hear is that, well, if you make the uh, the percentages low, 95, 100%, you'll shut down development, which I, I'm a little perplexed about because if the APFO triggers were to be actually honored and when these facilities reach 95 or 100 or, you know, whatever percent, the conditions that caused the crowding or the capacity cap to... Uh, to be to be triggered, the um, if the remedies of providing the extra infrastructure were just initiated, there would be no s stopping of development or even slowing it down. When you when you when you see that you're running out of space, build a new facility and keep moving forward. Anyway, that's all. Mr. Fox? So while we got you, can we ask you about school redistricting? Sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you can consider, ask. Consider I've got more questions about that uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, um, you know, questions, emails, you know, conversations about that. And I think I got the Sanctuary County and Mulch combined. Me too. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. so. We're working on it. All right. Thank you. Mr. Dr. Ball. Oh, Dr. Ball. Yeah. Chairman Valancourt, have you heard from the county executive on these recommendations yet? I haven't. If anyone else in our office has, um, it has not been shared with me. Okay. Um, Thank you. Nope. So when, did you, when did, have you guys provided those, or when, or when were they provided? Um, we voted the on these meeting. at the board meeting. We developed them at a board meeting three weeks ago. We, did, we voted on them with the, uh, the formal language that I've provided to you all last Thursday. Thursday, last Thursday, and we distributed it to anyone who has an email okay. address. Okay. Right. Although you guys may have just gotten it this morning. <laughs> <laughs> we know where we rate. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Alcourt. Okay. John Leon. Uh, yep. Thank you. Good evening. Good to see. Good to see you all again. So my name is John Nail. I live at ADA 62 Mount Joy Place, Attica City. So where that is is right by 129, and it's within walking distance to Howard High School. So I signed up to testify for this bill since July, and since then I've been talking to a lot of people because this raised a lot of questions and concerns. Now, I know a lot of people will talk about school today, but today I will talk about roads and congestions, traffic congestions, because people I talk to in neighborhoods or in schools or PTAs, before they talk about schools, people actually talk about congestions traffic congestions. And I treat this as a very, I, I think this should be treated as a very serious concern because um, right now we have, at least on East Columbia, we have moving parking lots like 175 at times, 29. And we have large choke points like 129 or Route 1 and 175 and then these are large choke points. Now smaller choke points, I mean people don't see it but they're there, they're in neighborhoods. For example, every morning out of my house, I see school buses line up and then there's only one way out of my neighborhoods. And then you have kids, you have uh, pedestrians, you have all these people and then this traffic congestion creates danger and especially risk for children. And we don't, and as far as I can see, I don't see the adequacy test or adequate measurements for um, I mean, not measurements, but instruments for mitigating these traffic problems. So these are congestions. And now, because of other problems, where I live, I happen to live next to Howard High School, which is, uh, I think probably everybody in this room knows it's 140% uh, overcapacitated. Long Reach next to it is not as bad, but almost there. And then these are problems. Now, I understand that AFO, with AFO, that you can probably add new school to relieve some of the congestions and overcrowdingness, but by adding new school and adding new mo more houses, I don't, I don't know, I'm not exactly sure how that will resolve problems 
I mean, these problems in the future. So just before uh, my time is up, three, just three suggestions. Number one, review the FO test more frequently because I think uh, people are coming in uh, more often and at an increased level of volumes, so that should be reviewed. Uh, number two, regarding school, if 115% mean that we could go to 130 or 140%, let's try to lower that down to 100 and see if we can improve that. And number three, regarding roads, so number one, let's put more rigorous FO tests for roads so to relieve tra traffic congestions. Number two, improve public transportation. And number three, perhaps we need to consider new methods of transportation like autonomous driving and things like that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Any haters, Shaw. Catherine Melander comes next, and Cole Schnorf, Steve Hunt, and Bruce Harvey. Hello. Good evening. I am Annie Heidershaw. I live at 9913 Frederick Road. And uh, today is actually September 11th, as you all know. I'd like to take a moment of my testimony to remember those Americans that lost their lives on this day 16 years ago, including the brave police officers and firefighters who were doing their job. Thank you. I am the mother of four children, two in high school and two in elementary school. I've lived in Howard County for the last 17 years. I'm an active member of the community, having served on the HCPSS calendar committee, and, um, and I'm currently serving, serving on the elementary school PTA as well as on the board of the Howard County Muslim Council. It is disappointing to see how the school redistricting issue has needlessly torn apart our county. It's important to remember that being a good citizen means that we care for each of our fellow citizens and we do what we can do for all of our county residents. It is absolutely heartbreaking to see neighborhoods fighting other neighborhoods and vilifying children within some of our schools. That being said, it is imperative that going forward the Adequate Public Facilities Ordinance, also known as APFO, covers all public facilities, including the police, fire stations, water supplies, as well as other utilities like schools and as our previous speaker mentioned, transportation. I hope we can agree that we need to keep all of Howard County residents safe. Every single member of our county, you and I included, needs these public facilities to be at the right level. Remember, being a good citizen means that we care for each of our fellow citizens and we do what we can for all of our county residents. Second, the threshold percentage for school capacity should be at 100% and not 115%. I was happy to learn that the Board of Education has recommended the exact same thing. There is no need for our children to suffer in squished class, clown, cla clown car classrooms. As we know, being a good citizen means that we care for each of our fellow citizens and we do what we can for all of our county residents, including our children. Third, if you are going to develop areas in the county, and let me be clear, I'm not against development, then develop in a smart way for goodness sake. Increase the mitigation amount and make sure it's done in a logical, mathematical manner. Proper mitigation will only help our children's schools. Because we've continued to allow this disastrously low level of mitigation, our school system can only cover the cost of portables and no permanent solutions. According to Forbes, Howard County is the fourth richest country, the richest, well, that would be nice, the fourth, fourth richest county in the country. It is sickening, literally and figuratively, portables, supposedly a temporary solution, have sadly become a long-term fixture. Why should our children be squished in those clown car-like classrooms and mold-prone portables? Remember, being a good citizen means that we care for each of our fellow citizens and we do what we can for all of our county residents. Thank you, Mrs. Shaw. Thank you. Any questions, colleagues? Thank you. Have a good evening. Catherine Melander. Hi, my name is Kathy Mylander. I reside at 3447 Arcadia Drive in Ellicott City. I'm a resident in District 1, a parent of a child facing redistricting, a pediatrician in this county who interacts with families every day who are affected by these issues of redistricting their children, but also severe overcrowding in the classroom. I did want to share with you today what it means to have a child who's in a, in a school that's a little bit over capacity, Centennial High School. Um, you know, they don't have a place to sit at lunch, so they stand with their friends. That's not a big deal. But when classes are full and they want to change a class, they don't have classes to change into. So they're, they pretty much are stuck taking whatever class they're initially assigned. Um, 
and so they don't have choice in their education. The can of responsibility has been kicked back and forth, but really the this APFO consideration is so important. Um, and I think the prior speakers which were much more eloquent and I agree with all three of them and what they are requesting, but I do think that this can be a legacy issue for all of you. Um, you know, we know your time is limited on this county council, but what are the people in the future gonna remember of your time here on this council? And what people are gonna remember is that we either change this APFO and not, not adopt the amendment that is currently being recommended, but to make it stronger. Um, increase the developers' contributions to public schools from the really paltry $1.25 per square foot to something more like $10 per square foot, which is what our neighboring Montgomery County is doing, um, to make them improve, uh, contribute to improvements in the sewer infrastructure, water projects, make them contribute to the emergency services required to appropriately serve the new members of our community. We'll remember you for this prosperity story of Howard County. You know, we won't think of it as the problem of, over of overcrowding and redistricting year, you know, time and time again. We won't think of it as long waits in the emergency room, long transport times to the hospital with a sick, with a sick patient in an ambulance, you know, be a part of the prosperity story of Howard County, not a part of its demise. That's all I ask. Thank you, ma'am. Any, any questions? Thank you. Cole Schnorf, then uh, Bruce Harvey, and Joel Hurwitz. Good evening, Chairman Weinstein and members of the council. My name is Cole Schnorf. I reside at 4912 Valley View overlooking Ellicott City. I'm here to testify tonight in my capacity as the vice chair of the Adequate Public Facilities Review Task Force, but not for the task force because the task force did not actually vote on my testimony. First, I'd like to mention the makeup of the task force and the process for arriving at our recommendations. The task force consisted of a diverse group of 22 voting and two non-voting members. The members included one person appointed by each of you, a school board member, a past school board member, a school principal, a teacher, a representative of the PTA council, four residential developers, a commercial developer, a realtor, and representatives of several community and citizen groups. Needless to say, it took a lot of give and take to reach consensus on most issues, and no single interest group could pass or block motions on its own. The task force decided early in its life to require a two-thirds vote of all members, not just those present, to pass a motion. This is in contrast to past APFO task forces which required unanimity to pass a motion. Any member could suggest a topic to study, request experts to come in and present that topic, and make motions for consideration by the task force. Next, I would like to address the many topic areas we studied, discussed, and upon which we voted. The motions are summarized in my written testimony but I won't go through them all in my oral testimony because there's not time. But suffice it to say, we considered just about any imaginable public facility test. Only two of them even received a simple majority vote, and those votes were for consideration of coming up with a test, not an actual motion for a specific test. The next area I wish to discuss is the school's test. Many people have testified and will testify in favor of reducing the capacity threshold to 100% for elementary and middle schools. After all the education and discussion that took for place in our task force and the diverse makeup of our task force, such a motion was made and only received four favorable votes among all the task force members. It's a complicated issue that requires a lot of thought. The compromise we struck to reduce the capacity threshold to 110% with extra payment to pass at 115 and 120 um, did receive the favorable vote of the members. There was also a vote to replace a, region test with a region's test with an adjacent school test, which was all, one short vote of the two-thirds and might consider, um, be worthy of further consideration. And I've summarized some of the school votes that we took. F two final points. APFO, under, unlike most other, um, Howard County, unlike most other jurisdictions, has an allocation limit overriding its APFO legislation. 
and that allocation limit places a, is a very strong planning tool for planning for future infrastructure needs. And lastly, um, when the FO was first formed in Howard County, home, new home construction was causing most of the strain on public infrastructure. Now that's been replaced by um, thank you, Mr. growth in um, existing housing. Thank you, Mr. So. Mr. Schorff, thank so you. So I urge you to vote, vote for the okay. recommend the legislation. Thank you very much. Any questions, colleagues? And thank you. And to, I'll, I'll take this time to thank all the other members of the task force. Uh, my binder is this thick uh, from all the things that you did look at and uh, appreciate the work that you all. But I see several members in yeah, here. Several members are here yeah. to testify tonight and have testified before. Right. So they, right. they did put in a lot of effort. No, yeah. and we, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harvey? We have Joel Hurwitz, uh, James Frazier, Kevin Burke. Good evening, Chairman Weinstein and County Council members. It's an honor to be here. Bruce Harvey, 7792 Elmwood Road, Fulton, Maryland. Also president and co-owner of Williamsburg Homes and uh, a proud member of the task force 23 meetings later. Uh, Cole's done a great job of uh, summarizing the work of the task force, the difficulty, and the time that each of us spent. Um, I'm here to, in favor of CB61. Um, the, our, um, the APFO that we created um, many years ago um, has worked. Um, many people don't feel that way. Um, and the big difference, the thing that we want to emphasize is, uh, what first thing is the housing allocations. No other county and jurisdiction. For those of us that work in other counties, this APFO is the best of all of them. And the, um, and I'm not here to encourage 50 million new homes to be built in this county. Predictability, responsibility, and simpleness are what's important. The housing allocations provides um, the level of what everybody's agreed to as to what is going to be built. It's a big restriction on anybody that brings land development to the to the table on school on schools 100% capacity is 100% capacity in in different modes um, and the people that have developed the capacity charts um, will tell have told us that you know that, that our our calculations aren't the same as the state and so and the 115% limit is like the 55 mile an hour speed limit in essence. That's not very smart. It should be 100% is 100%, but it's not. So I think you guys, the council all recognizes that. There's certainly a political problem there, but the 100% capacity as to how capacity is calculated can be really, um, is, in, is the real importance of the calculation. So. 115% is a valid rule in, under today's uh, theory. School overcrowding isn't only due to new construction. I think we all realize that. And that's why if we lower the limit, we're going to have more redistricting. And I think that's what we're trying not to do. Um, again, I want to thank the members of the APFO task force. I want to thank you. Um, and I don't understand why we wouldn't want to change the open, closed chart language. I think that's very misunderstood. So that, that surprises me that that simple recommendation to make it a little more meaningful um, is asked to be changed. That's my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Dr. Ball. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Harvey. To what do you attribute the differences in school capacities around other jurisdictions in Maryland? Um, in, in Anne Arundel County, they use the state calculations. They don't do their own calculations. They're, they're done differently. Have you looked at the state calculations versus the county calculations for Howard County? Um, I haven't looked at the specifics. Be happy to. Okay. Um, my, my conversations relate to conversations with Joel back when he was here. Mm -hmm. So your belief that other jurisdictions being lower is only because they're using state calculations versus county calculations? Um, my belief is that yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Fox, I, I, that may have been the same question. I, I was just, I was also just sort of confused, just trying to understand where you were going with with that, and maybe, you know, if you can just email more detail as far as on your thoughts on that after you know 
looking at you know looking at both the state and and other uh, jurisdictions. I guess that's where you were going with right. you know the difference between one hundred percent in one share situation versus one hundred and fifteen in another. But I wasn't totally following you, so okay. you could expand. Not now, but uh, feel free to email. <laughs> Why not now? Because <laughs> I we'd like to get through everybody tonight. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Irving. Joel Hurwitz. And we have uh, James Frazier, Kevin Burke, and Melissa, Melissa Metz. Joel Hurwitz, 5681 Harpers Farm Road, Columbia. I just only want to talk about the four year limit for the open closed. Um, Jeff Brunow told you, and I guess your work session a few months ago in this room, that it was picked because that would avoid a taking. Talking to him, uh, apparently this became because some attorney 25 years ago on some committee apparently thought four years was about the right time that wouldn't be a taking. But apparently no one's really thought through how the Supreme Court might have changed all that in the last 25 years, and in particular the Demure versus Wisconsin case that was previously discussed. Um, so I think you should have a different whole, open yourselves up to rethinking the whole thing of whether you need a limit at all, and particularly in light of the Supreme Court's ruling in Muir. Um, my taking from that case is, one, it deals with the size of the parcel, so it's going to take a number of years until the courts work out exactly what the court meant in all the situations. But there are situations where if you're subdividing a place that already has a house on it, you might not be any taking if because you already have economic value of your property. And that's the second part that Lisa Markovitz talked about was the court's comment that there's no taking unless you're deprived of all economic value of your property. So I'd like to have rethink the whole four-year thing instead. What can you do instead of if it's closed permanently? You're already allowed, I guess, to build convents and churches and things like that on certain uh, residential zoning classes. So open it up to age-restricted housing. Um, then it has no impact on the schools. You're not being deprived of economic value, therefore there can't be a taking. If the developer doesn't think that's good for him, that's not, I don't think, the county's responsibility or to say that he wouldn't make as much money as he want. The court said you're not being deprived of all economic value. So I guess I want you to rethink that. And I also like Hopefully, uh, the solicitor was supposed to be giving an opinion, I guess, on that. I hope you will make that public. Um, there's often too many things in the solicitor's office that seem to be kept uh, secret in this county. Montgomery County puts a lot of their solicitor opinions on their website. So at least in regard to a policy pr provision, I'd hope you would, uh, I guess, as the client, would agree to release that so that we could have a debate of what the uh, Muir case means and what we should do with the four-year limit or get rid of it. Thank you, Mr. Hurwitz. Uh, Mr. Gwen, uh, if in our work session coming up, um, if you wouldn't mind being uh, willing to, to share a, a brief uh, overview of, of the Office of Law's uh, opinion on the matter. And uh, I know it's a lengthy, uh, uh, lengthy uh, finding, but if we can be succinct in our discussion about that, that would be great. Thank Thanks you, for discussing it. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Hurwitz. Uh, Mr. Frazier, James Frazier, Kevin Burke, Melissa Metz, and Steve Breeden. Uh, good evening, Councilman Weinstein and uh, council members. My name is Jamie Frazier. I've been the chairman of the Howard County chapter of the Home Builders Association for uh, uh, four or five years at this point. Um, I'm here to speak uh, in favor of CP61. Um, and uh, specifically in favor of it without uh, substantive changes. Um, uh, when I would make a note that uh, we have, uh, I believe it's at least five members um, who showed up after 630 because they knew there was something else on the agenda. Um, they're not signed up to speak, um, so but we, we do have more people here than are even signed up. Um, so uh, first I want to acknowledge, um, I, I've got kids myself. I completely understand the concern about uh, school overcrowding, and I've that's not, uh, I, I'm not in any way trying to discredit that, uh, and I 
was very impressed with the uh, uh, the children who spoke. I think that's a that's great. Um, but wh what I do want to do is is point out that um, that's not really the issue. Uh, school overcrowding um, is, is a function of a couple of different things. Um, it's the uh, and I'm just going to sort of quote to you uh, a, a couple of really important uh, facts. Um, the issue is not whether an individual school is overcrowded or not. Um, the, the point is that in the school, um, 2018 uh, Howard's County School budget, uh, overall the school capacity in the entire county is 99% in middle schools and 101% in elementary schools. Um, that's well below the, uh, the capacity that's allowed, which is 120%. Um, so we have the capacity. It's a utilization of that capacity. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, you're not going to stop growth of the demand for seats in schools. Um, and here's why. 60%, uh, and these are the county's numbers, 60% of new seats in schools come from people moving out and selling their house to people who want to move into the great schools in Howard County. Those are existing homes. There is a huge disproportionate number of existing homes that are sold to people that want to move here and move into the schools, particularly the good schools. Those are the ones that are going to get overcrowded. So you're going to see you got 60% of the new demand for seats is coming from resales. The next thing uh, is that um, you, you, oh, on average, uh, over the last 10 years, we've had uh, between 800 and 1,500 new seats needed every year. Um, and, and that averages about um, 1,100 new seats every year. That's gonna, that growth is going to continue, and it's not coming all from new development. Yes, new development does um, drive a piece of it, but you've got to plan for growth. The county does plan for growth, and uh, shutting down development is not a, uh, a means to do that. Um, let's see. Um, so what we've got to do is balance property rights, planning goals, business interests um, with the understandable uh, concerns of people who don't want to see changes um, and um, make sure that we're offsetting uh, the impact of new development on public facilities. We're not going to solve all the problems by making new development pay more uh, because some of these problems are because there's a lot of, you know, some of them are growth problems from um, longer back. Um, so we don't love CB61. It is not a great deal for us, but it's the best compromise. And it was a compromise that was formed over a lot of time, uh, 10 months, uh, 22 meetings. Uh, there were 23 members on the task force. Uh, many county resources came in to educate that task force. Uh, the task force uh, considered facts that are that are so complicated and issues and and perspectives that are so complicated and so divisive but at the end of the day we we came up with or they I'm, I wasn't on the task force but they came up with a set of recommendations um, and that was a comprehensive master um, grand bargain if you will some things they didn't win some things they did on all sides and what I want to do is, is make sure that what you see here in CB61 represents the compromise in its entirety. We can't take apart just school capacity and think that, oh, well, you know, that wasn't part of a balance that is in the whole basket of CB61. You can't pull one piece out and keep the balance that that, that task force worked so hard to create. Um, so, and then the last thing I'll, I'll point out, you know, actually I won't, I have no time left. <laughs> Thank you. Even though uh, it's frozen so at seven questions. seconds, that uh, no, still ca the clock is still catching up to you, but I appreciate you stopping at the beat. Uh, Mr. Fox's yeah, question. Yeah, I'm, well, actually, I'm not getting into merits of, of, these, of this stuff tonight again due to time, but uh, since our school board members aren't up here to respond, I just want to say all of our schools are great schools. <laughs> I, <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Frazier, I have yes, a couple sir. questions. You talked about new development shouldn't pay more. Have you looked at uh, how much new development pays in other jurisdictions in Maryland, and do you think that Howard County is comparable? Um, every county has different APF um, allocations, and it's so it's, I, I've looked at it. I think we're uh, reasonable. Um, 
we're in the uh, we're. I would have to give you an analysis. I, I, okay. I can't answer that uh, off the top of my head. But I, I know that we're not dramatically higher or dramatically lower than other counties. And you, ladies and gentlemen, the, a little respect for everybody who's testifying. Nobody is calling right, let me, out. Let me rephrase other that. Other speaking. counties that I am active in. That would be a better way to say it. Okay. And you indicated that uh, you, as far as developers, didn't love it and it was a compromise. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you think you gave up? Um, Again, I was not on the task force, um, but I can tell you that um, uh, the grand bargain uh, specifically that we're talking about is the idea of a uh, of reducing school capacity um, rating um, if there's an enabling legislation that accompanied it. And that was uh, a recommendation that didn't move forward because we're gonna do the uh, enabling legislation. That's the compromise specifically where uh, we were giving something up in exchange for the um, uh, state enabling legislation when that comes. So we expect that that's um, going to happen in the future. And I'm, I believe you're aware of the recommendations that uh, were passed by the task force. Um, but because the state legislation, enabling legislation, can't happen until the uh, session later this year, um, that's not in this CB61. So in this CB61 that you don't love, can you talk about some of the compromises that you think were made? Uh, we have members of the task force um, that will be testifying later. Uh, okay. The better thing would be for them to talk about the things that uh, they debated and where we and how it all shook out. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Yeah. Mr. Rosser. Yeah, have you or anyone you know started working with the delegation to put that fee in? I'm sorry, say that again? Have you started working with our state folks to get that fee imposed? Uh, is I will not be doing that. Um, I believe that's going to be happening um, through the. Uh, uh, I'm not sure who who specifically is going to do that, but uh, we I do know that that's um, the intent is for that to move forward. But I don't know specifically who does that. Okay, and the other thing is you gave a sixty percent number that is due to resale. Yeah. Can you just um, give me a source for that? Yeah, because absolutely. I've heard that a number of times. Yep. I would love to give you a source for that. Um, it is in the DPZ uh, recommendations, um, the technical staff report from DPZ. I think it's on page 15, if I'm not mistaken. OK. And I said it's about 60%. Uh, the exact number is 58%. Thank you. I was just wondering if you had, other than our sources, if you had any of you of yours. That's right. That you were you were going. I guess one of my questions related to that, having heard some of those numbers previously, um, is sometimes that is people actually moving out and they're truly leaving. Sometimes it's because there still was a home that was then built for somebody to maybe downsize into, and then that's why they ended up having the space free up in an existing home. So trying to understand those numbers, I'm not sure how easy it is to, to get them, but I know that's part of it because I just know, you know, firsthand too many, uh, too many situations of that myself as far as where, where that occurred. I, I can give you a, a very good um, anecdote that is relevant, um, which is uh, Pointers, Pointers Run Elementary and Fulton Elementary. Over the last three years, um, they've been swept back and forth between open and closed every year. But there's not a development um, that's driving that. That's, that's um, people selling houses and demographic changes that, that's happening in those local areas. So, so let me give you, okay, so I understand what you're saying, especially since I'm down in Fulton. Right, no, I thought, um, I thought you is, is a lot that. Of, you know, while there, while there are a lot of younger families going um, you know, into Fulton as far as on the new side, there are also d people downsizing into mm -hmm. Fulton. So out of like, for example, out of my neighborhood and then younger families are moving in. So the resale is happening, but right. it, it happened because there was a place for them to downsize to within the county that opened up as a result of the new home. Mm -hmm. So I I'm wondering how much of that was a result of a domino effect versus just somebody moving out of the county is, is where I'm, I, I guess is where I'm going. Uh, so do you have an I idea of those numbers? It, I can't give you the numbers. I, I think the takeaway, though, is that the task force spent hours upon okay, hours. Okay, that's fine. I'm just asking hours. if you knew them. You, you no, no, no. You brought but, up numbers, so. But it, and it's complicated, and, and 
that's why the task force was assigned, because it was such a complicated issue and needed that level of detail and analysis. And I, I don't have it. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Yeah. Kevin Burke. Mr. Burke. Okay. Melissa Metz. I did not see Ms. Metz here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Breeden. Then we have, after uh, Steve Breeden, we have Tim Latimer, Gina Desiderio Edmondson, Edmondson, and Josh Edmondson. Steve Breeden, 587 Gaither Road, Sykesville, Howard County, on the right side of the river. Anyway, I'm <laughs> testifying as a member of the most recent APFO committee. Unlike some of our committee members, I believe after so much time spent negotiating the various aspects of what is good and what could be tweaked, that we all agreed on what we've presented to you, what has been presented to you. There's one minor change where the language inadvertently could be interpreted to suggest that a project could be held up for off-site improvements, which the project can't control. This was not the intent and should be clarified. As for the rest of the recommendations, I'm in favor, like most of the committee, that agreed to, agreed to them. I've lived here my whole life and been working in this county doing land development for 37 years. I remember the first and second APFO committees and the processes they went through. Both required unanimous agreements for any and all recommendations that were made to the administration. They were composed of knowledgeable people, many from within the government, who were trying to serve the greater good of the county and not individual concerns. They tried to avoid the unintended consequences of picking and choosing popular adjustments. In fact, the first group said that if the council were not able to adopt the plan as negotiated by them, as experts, they should not adopt anything at all. The 100% agreement made sure bad ideas were not suggested. That was not the case with this committee. The majority of this group did not work for the county or with development regulations daily or for the most part ever. Only a few of us really understood how APFO works. Instead of a 100% agreement, just seven of 23 members could stop any proposed change and 16 could pass any change. Most of the 20 plus meeting date time was spent with those of us who work with the APFO daily, educating those with less experience. Despite this lack of balance, the committee agreed on the changes included in Council Bill 61. I'm appalled that some of the committee members have chosen to go rogue and not support the efforts of the committee after agreeing early on that we would all support the report. The suggestion that the schools be tested for 100% capacity makes no sense. The first APFO said to test, said to test for 120% capacity, as that, on average, is 25 children per classroom times 1.2, which equals 30 children, which also equals the state-rated capacity of the school and what is required to get state funding. With the capacity dropped to 115%, we're now building for 30 kids per class and only putting in, on average, 28.75. With the new recommendations, we will only be including 27.5. It doesn't sound like much, but over the 41,000 students in elementary and middle schools, the state rate of capacity actually exists for almost 10% more. Most of these students will be here regardless of APFO, as most new students come from the sale of existing homes, not new homes, particularly when most of the new homes being built in the county these days are apartments. I think we live in a very good county with a very high quality of living. That's why people want to live here. I don't understand why those are so negative and think everything that the county does is wrong. Unfortunately, some people are just not happy people. I pretty, I'm pretty sure that they live in homes that we created for them, yet would deny future residents the opportunity to live here as well. Please do the right thing and adopt the upper ordinance that the committee Thank works you, Mr. hard Reed. to agree. Mr. Ross. Yeah, have you approached the state legislature about raising raising that fee? No, I I believe the administration will do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ball had asked a question earlier of Mr. Frazier, uh, just in terms of the the grand bargain and, and if there are things and so, sort of on balance. He spoke to a little bit in your. In your I, I'm not going to go rogue like some of my uh, committee members did. I mean, I, we all negotiated this. This was, it is a grand bargain. I mean, there, yes, there are things I'm not happy about, but, but this is what we agreed on. And right. I just don't think it's fair to start picking and choosing. No, sure. And I think the, the question was, you know, in terms of the trade-offs, how would you characterize the trade-offs? I, I, I didn't like them. It was not a balanced committee. I think that, that, that it's what we all agreed on and what we should choose. Okay. Any other questions, colleagues? Mr. Fox? Uh, oh. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Tim Latimer. Then we have uh, Gina Desidera Edmison, Josh Edmison, and Vicki Catronio. Good evening, sir. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Tim Latimer. I live at 8452 Leaf Court, Columbia, 
21045. First of all, I would like to say thank you to you uh, all for serving the people of Howard County, especially on a long, light, long night like tonight. Thanks also for the opportunity to comment on the proposed changes to APFO. I'm here to suggest that it's time for a new way of thinking about development in Howard County. Business as usual is not the solution. It's the problem. The intense debates that we're hearing today about things like APFO, school redistricting, and large-scale mulching projects tear at the fabric of our communities. They come from a piecemeal approach to planning and development that is inadequate and outmoded. Even if the council fixes APFO, it would just be nibbling around the edges of a much more fundamental problem, the lack of any requirement for a holistic process of environmental impact assessments for development projects. Howard County should adopt comprehensive environmental impact assessment requirements that address all types of development. Such requirements should include, among other things, a process for the county to screen proposed projects and identify those that may have potentially significant environmental impacts, impact assessment reports that are fact-based and reflect expert analysis, and a sound and transparent process that affords the public with opportunities to become aware of a project and to comment on draft impact assessments. It's also time for a new way of thinking about how we manage risks. If recent events have taught us anything, it's that climate change is fundamentally a local issue. Its impacts are local, but so too are its solutions. So let's start by putting in place a more holistic approach to evaluating the environmental impacts of development projects. These types of requirements are not rocket science, and they're not anything new. In fact, other states have had these types of requirements in place for decades, where experience has shown conclusively that environmental impact reporting uh, requirements have actually benefited the environment without hampering economic development. When my family returned to the United States in 2002 after many years of living overseas, we did not choose to live in Northern Virginia like most of my Foreign Service colleagues. We chose to live here in Columbia in Howard County because of this county's superior quality of life. Northern Virginia is poorly planned, overbuilt, and its traffic is a nightmare. Its nickname, Nova, is perfectly fitting for anybody who understands Spanish because NOVA means no-go. We don't want Howard County to become also Thank known you, as no-go. Thank Appreciate you, Mr. Lyman. Thank you. Any questions, colleagues? Thank you, sir. Have a good evening. Gina Desideri Edmondson. And we have Joshua Edmondson, Vicki Catronio, Wendy Williams Abrams, Kate Hudkins. Hello. Hello. My name is Gina Desiderio Edmison. I live at 4713 Round Hill Road, Ellicott City, Maryland, 21043. My home for 10 years. My two sons attend Howard County Schools. I'm here to speak as a member of my neighborhood group, Keep Worthington Intact, established in response to the school's proposal to fracture our contiguous community in half, separating literal next door neighbors. My activism in redistricting led me to, re to discover that the county has been shamefully inept in maintaining appropriate measures to ensure we have essential infrastructure. I'm concerned that if we don't do a better job controlling and planning for development, our schools will continue to be forced to redistrict every two to three years, while our school facilities are overcrowded, in need of repair, and inundated with short-term temporary portables that become long-term health and safety hazards. This is an unacceptable and untenable state, and I'm here to ask you, our elected representatives, to be responsive to your constituents. I've been even more astonished to find what an outlier Howard County is in comparison to other neighboring counties. We may lead the state in other issues, but we certainly do not lead in our commitment to infrastructure. We fail to set reasonable standards or exact proportional fees to maintain critical infrastructure. I am requesting that Council Bill C, or CB61 be amended with the following provisions to more fairly and equitably balance well-planned growth and effective mitigation for our public infrastructure. One, reduce the school capacity limits, including high schools, to be set at 100. 100 percent. I do understand we should not want to stop development altogether, but developers must be required to pay substantially increased surcharges after the initial cap is, is reached. Two, 
establish mitigation funding additional time or both when a school reaches 95% capacity. Otherwise, we are too late to make capital improvements vital for our children's learning and safety. Three, increase the real estate transfer tax by 50 basis points from 1.5% to 2% to account for the growth that does come from resales. Four, include a provision that ensures that additional excise taxes supplement rather than supplant existing county provided funds. These additional fees and taxes are needed in addition to the funding already allocated. Four, five, there should be no reductions to the current wait time for housing allocations for school tests. Six, APFO needs to be reviewed every four years. Waiting 10 years to review does not allow for necessary fine tuning and changing needs of a growing county. And seven, include measures for public safety, emergency services, recreation, and other community facilities. If we want to continue to keep Coward County a desirable place to live and work, we need these critical amendments for a stronger APFO. Redistricting may have been the initial reason I got involved, but you do have my attention now, and I can assure you that HOCO parents vote. Thank, Thank you very you. much, ma'am. Any questions? Thank you. I was just going to say, be careful uh, getting involved with the redistricting. This is where it got me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a warning for everybody. Uh, Josh Edmondson. Okay. Uh, Vicky Catronio. Wendy Williams Abrams. I saw Vicky as well, but I've called her name twice. Okay. Well, uh, Wendy Williams Abrams, Kate Hudkins, Richard Cohn. Evening. Uh, my name is Wendy Williams Abrams. I live at 3144 St. Charles Place. I am here representing all of the children in the Howard County School System who are dependent on the County Council to protect them from the effects of allowing extensive development without adequate mitigation by the developers. We have severe overcrowding in many of our schools, and I believe that the reason the County Council doesn't have enough money to build more schools or fully renovate current schools is because developers aren't paying their fair share of the infrastructure costs. In order to support an ever-increasing population, we need a dedicated school revenue source that should come primarily from the developers. They currently pay less than 20% of the cost of each new student's seat in school while char charging buyers a premium to live in Howard County. It's a win-win for the developers, but it's a lose-lose for the citizens of our county. I believe that one reason our fees and taxes are so favorable toward the developers is because many of the county council members who are elected to represent the citizens of this county are basically indebted to the developers who help to fund their campaigns. Our county's future is being sold to the highest bidder, and the average citizen is getting slammed with the extra costs of building the necessary infrastructure. For example, we need a new high school, too many students in portables, and kids who are unable to open their lockers in packed hallways. The Board of Ed is dependent on the county executive for the funding to make it a reality. The county executive looks at the capital budget and sees inadequate funds to tackle all the projects desperately needed by the county, so he tells the Board of Ed there isn't yet money to build a new school. The Board of Ed is then forced to redistrict and consider other creative means of meeting the students' needs with inadequate resources. The way I believe this should work, and as it does in many of our neighboring counties and states, is that when developers want to build, assessments are done to determine if it's in the best interest of the county to allow development in a specific area. Then infrastructure is evaluated. Are the roads capable of supporting more vehicles? Are there available seats in the elementary, middle, and high schools? Do we have adequate f fire and emergency services? After those evaluations are made, developers are told what they need to contribute in order to make their project feasible and not a financial burden to the existing budget and tax base. Developers make enough money building in Howard County that their profits won't suffer if they were assessed appropriate taxes, fees, or proffers. APFO is supposed to be our framework for meeting the infrastructure needs of our county. However, our APFO is so inadequate and favorable toward builders that it is not protecting us from the endless demands placed on our county's budget by the new development. I am not against developers or development in Howard County. I am in favor of them paying their fair share to support the infrastructure needs of the new citizen citizens they're bringing in. We need to revisit the APFO legislation in a committee led by citizens, not developers and their representatives. The citizens of Howard County deserve to have adequate representation at the table. APFO should be reevaluated every few years. APFO should ensure that developers are held responsible for financially mitigating their development's effects. Howard County citizens have had the wool removed from our eyes, and we are seeing the county council's motives and financial allegiances for what they are. We are disgusted by what we see. You were elected to represent us, not pay back the developers who helped fund your campaigns. The 2018 elections will look very different because now we know, we know, and we vote. 
Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Nope. Thank you very much. Kate Hudkins. Richard Cohn. Mr. Cohn. After Mr. Cohn, we have uh, Aggie Wojden, uh, Li Zhang, uh, Swapna Pamu. If you're in the room and you. Uh, Thank you, sir. Okay, I feel that um, we aren't thinking broadly enough about. Is there any your name and oh, uh, sorry. address, please? Name is Richard Cohn, and uh, live at five two one eight Woodstove Lane, Columbia. Uh, more than fifty years ago, Jim Rouse had a vision. Speaking of Columbia, he said we created ways for people to care more deeply about one another, to stimulate, encourage, release creativity, minimize intolerance and bigotry. He said that. He wanted Columbia to be a real multifaceted city, not a bedroom suburb. It should be possible for its residents to find everything they needed here, jobs, education, recreation, health care, and any other necessity. He envisioned that different types of housing would be nestled together so that people of different incomes and races would interact with one another. His vision is not the Howard County we live in today. Over the past 20 years, and especially in the past 10 years, I've lived here for 20 years and I've seen these changes occur. High density housing, a lot of it low cost, lower cost housing, but still expensive, has been concentrated in certain areas. And it, in other types of housing, it, it, it's excluded from other areas. And that's because of the way we're planning. As we've seen recently, the Board of Education has been further segregating our schools by drawing district lines between wealthy and lower income communities. And I have a graphic that shows some of the density and some of the changes that you'd see in the handout that I provided. And you see that a lot of the low-income areas now centered in, in part of Columbia. The council and the county executive need to plan for growth that will restore integrated communities. The APFO suggests that there is room in a school, or even if there isn't, development can rush forward in the design and at the, sp the speed dictated by the developers. This is not the way to design and build the type of communities that serve our long-term interests. Developers tell you that they have a right to build wherever they want if they can make a quick profit, but they don't have this right. We have vested the council with the power to make laws restricting development to the benefit of people. Certainly, developers should not be permitted to build where there is a lack of public resources, schools, roads, public safety. Certainly, developers should be required to fund the cost of the public infrastructure that is needed. But development should also be restricted to the type that is needed in each area to balance out types of housing and industry and businesses. In other words, if there are a few single-family homes in an area, they should be allowed. <coughs> uh, but if, I'm sorry, if, if, there are, if there are a few single uh, family homes in an area, they should be allowed. But in an area that is dense with housing, more dense housing should be restricted. We could permit apartments in areas that don't have much high-dense housing. We should keep land set aside for business and industry. If more people could work in Columbia as well as live here, we could have improved quality of life and less traffic. The idea that enrollment in schools will be a single factor in, de in deciding residential construction is kind of ridiculous. The num <clears throat> okay, and you can read the rest. Thank you, sir, and I appreciate, <clears throat> appreciate your uh, testimony. Okay, um, well, I've called a few folks that haven't come out. I'm gonna try one more time. Um, uh, we have uh, Aggie Wojnan, Lee Zhang, uh, Swapna Pamu, Brian Chadwick, Beth Gettleman, okay, okay, very good. So, Ag is, or are either of you Aggie Wojnan? Okay. Dr. Zhang, it's good to see you. Yes, uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, dear, uh, my name is uh, Lee Zhang. I uh, live in 8673, Wherefore to Drive, Atticus City, uh, Maryland. Uh, I'm also a distinguished professor and a director of the National Transportation Center at the University of Maryland. What I'm about to say certainly represents my uh, personal professional opinion, not that of the university. I'm very concerned uh, that a weak existing AFO have led to overcrowded schools and worsening traffic conditions uh, in our county. I'm here to support a stronger, amended council, uh, APFO and Council Bill 61 that more equitably balance the cost allocation of public infrastructure between developers and taxpayers. 
So having conducted traffic impact studies in many, many different counties across Maryland, I have concluded that Howard County has the weakest road test for new development proposals. The impact area defined by the current AFO road test in many cases only includes a single major intersection in each direction. In comparison, for larger scale development in Montgomery County and Prince George's County, they may very well require at least seven, seven intersections in each direction. When additional trips are produced from new development, their traffic congestion impact goes way beyond a single intersection. Uh, they cause longer delays on already congested roadways uh, far beyond the development site. Uh, traditional traffic impact study methods focus on this, focus on intersection level analysis, but there, there are now uh, more, much more advanced and accurate methods to allow decision makers such as yourself and planning board uh, members to see more comprehensive regional true impact, traffic impact of new development. I would urge the county council to examine these new tools and consider imposing much stronger road tests in the amended AFO. And also only a strong AFO can really protect the interest of the general public uh, in Howard County. Uh, when communities come to me asking me to do a traffic impact study to them in opposition to development uh, proposals that try to get a development done without paying anything for the negative impact, I ask them, why uh, do you come to me? Why don't you go to a traffic consulting firm to get it done? Uh, I was surprised by the answer. They told me very often they don't have money to do it, and even when they had the money, not a single firm in the entire state of Maryland, quote, dares to take on that business because they will be immediately put on a blacklist uh, by the developers, and uh, they will never get new businesses. Uh, so only you, our council members, can protect interests of those who cannot protect themselves. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank you. I appreciate that, and thank you for elaborating on our conversation from the other evening. I appreciate the information. Uh, questions? Any co colleagues? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Swapna Pamu, okay. Brianne Chadwick. We have uh, Beth uh, Gittleman, uh, Vicky Catronio, uh, Soren Rangaruju Kumar. Good evening. Good evening, members of the council. My name is Brianne Chadwick. I live at 9853 Helmwood Court in Ellicott City. Um, we moved here seven years ago, and we chose our home very carefully. In fact, um, right when we moved here, I lived in a hotel with my family for seven months with six children, ranging from two to 12, just to make sure we chose the right neighborhood, the right county, because we were looking all over Maryland. Um, and so seven years ago, we moved into our house, and I was 100% confident at that time that I'd made the right choice. In the seven years that I've been here, I have seen a lot of growth, and it's not surprising. I can understand why people want to live here. What baffles me, though, is the disconnect between the county council and the schools. Now, attendance area adjustments have gotten a lot of attention recently, and that's something that the council doesn't have a say in. That's a matter for the Board of Education. The problem is that the massive overcrowding, the rapidly growing need for new schools, and the chaos that occurs when families are moved from school to school is a direct result of the county council's actions or lack thereof. Our county has one of the highest growth rates in the state, and we're also in the top three counties for overcrowded schools. Yet the school impact fees paid by developers are ten to $20,000 less than those levied by a majority of, Howard, of Maryland counties. $10,000 to $20,000 less than other crowded school counties. Development projects in closed school areas are allowed to proceed after four years, regardless of the school utilization at that point. The overcrowding problem does not disappear in four years, and it doesn't magically vanish as soon as a developer breaks ground. Um, we've heard a lot tonight about how new development is not the biggest source of the problem. On August 12th at a community meeting, um, an announcement was made that 7,000 new housing units will be built in Columbia in the next five years, and another 1,000 in Laurel. If these developers are not contributing enough for the school district and the system to keep up, how is that not a problem? How is that related to existing development? 
I challenge you to prove to the residents of Howard County, your constituents, that you are more concerned about their welfare than you are about campaign donations from developers. Remove the four year limit, lower the acceptable threshold for schools capacity, increase developers school impact fees, include high schools when you are looking at whether or not an area should be open or closed to development and protect the people you represent. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, before we go away. I can't leave something unsaid. Yeah, no, okay. Ms. Sigety. I'm sorry. Um, Good evening. Thank Good you evening. for being here. Mm -hmm. um, I do need to um, correct something that you said, okay. all right, because I don't want it to be out there. You made a comment about being at a community meeting where you had heard that there would be 7,000 new houses built in Columbia. In the uh, next five in years. The next that was five years. Yes. Let me tell you what we did, okay, okay, so that people will know. We did, in fact, increase the number of housing units allowed in downtown Columbia to 6,200 over the next 20 to 30 years, okay? okay. So it's, it's not a 7,000 unit freight train coming right at you. My, my notes were hard to read, mm -hmm. so thank you for the clarification. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Beth Gettleman? Okay. Then we have uh, Vicky Catronio, Sir Rungaro Du Kumar, Diane Butler, I thought I saw Miss Butler here, and Tanya Lopez. Oh, hello, my name is Beth Gettleman. I live at 11409 Butterfruit Way in Ellicott City. I'm here tonight to voice my opposition to CB61 in its current form. Uh, while it's a start to addressing the overcrowding in some of Howard County's schools, it does not go far enough. And I support amendments to the bill as stipulated by the Board of Education and the PTA Council of Howard County. Um, sitting here tonight is very important to me because when my husband and I decided to move our three children to Howard County, we could have lived anywhere in the country. The nature of our work at that time allowed us that opportunity, and after looking at many counties in Maryland, we ultimately decided on Howard County based on the stellar reputation of the public schools. Uh, unfortunately, we made the same decision that many families do, and the population of the county is growing faster than we can build the public infrastructure to support it. Uh, the elementary school where my children currently attend school is a good example of this issue. At the beginning of the 2016-17 school year, our principal at Manor Woods Elementary School told us he had room to absorb two more classes worth of kids inside the school building. By the end of the school year, he was requesting seven portable classrooms be set up outside the school building. Our school population was 113% last year. We were projected to reach 124% this year and 200% in five years. Uh, APFO, as it currently stands, did not prevent this from happening at Manor Woods. And unfortunately, CB61, as it's currently proposed, would not prevent this from happening at Manor Woods again. I understand that redistricting is supposed to help rectify some of these issues, but as we, are, uh, as we are experiencing, it's a very painful and toxic way to rectify overcrowding. And why are we waiting until a school reaches such a high capacity in the first place? As the parent of children who attend a school that's hovering around the 115% capacity mark, I can tell you the educational environment suffers, the teacher's mindset is different, and the student's morale is affected. Now this is testimony that I could have emailed to you, but I chose to come out and person, uh, personally testify because nine months ago when the Manor Woods community was just beginning to understand how quickly and severely overcrowded our school was about to become, our PTA president organized a series of meetings with our school principal, the Office of School Planning, our Board of Ed Liaison, and eventually our County Councilman John Weinstein. Councilman Fox, you declined to attend a PTA meeting. At each of these meetings, we asked questions not only about what was going to be done to alleviate overcrowding at Manor Woods, but what was being done to make sure this didn't happen at other schools in Howard County. Each meeting seemed to end with few reassuring answers and a good amount of deflection and a bit of finger pointing at someone or something else as the root cause of overcrowding in the schools. Council Einstein, my family was in attendance uh, uh, at the meeting that you attended at Manor Woods that night. And we don't remember your exact words, but the gist of your message was you didn't know why APFA was written the way it was because you weren't on the council when it was first passed. But you are on the council now, as are all of your colleagues. So we hope that you will do something to support the investment the taxpayers Thank of you. Howard County have made in their public schools. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you for coming out to that meeting and to the... Sir, uh, uh, Vicky Catronia, and we had uh, Sern Rangar Kumar. 
Okay. Diane Butler, Tanya Lopez, Vipin uh, Sahijwani. I'm sorry I kept leaving the room. I heard my name was called a few yes. times. I shortened my testimony considerably, so I think you'll appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Good evening, members of County Council. My name is Vicki Catronio, 15005 Scottswood Court in Woodbine. I'm currently the uh, PTA Council of Howard County President, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of PTAC, uh, 74 PTAs, 29,000 members, and I guess representing over 70,000 students. I wanted to make my testimony a little different just to bring some a historical perspective to this because it's just like Groundhog Day here in Howard County. Um, in 2002, 15 years ago, this was printed in the newspaper. Time and again, those in charge of administering APFO have failed to predict mushrooming school enrollment in fast-growing areas, causing widespread crowding, contentious redistricting, and urgent demands for rapid school construction. It's just like today. Here we are again. In 2011, this was written. The school system is a victim of an APFO that has not been adequate to the task of sufficiently controlling residential development to prevent school overcrowding for any appreciable length of time, even though our little county has opened 29 schools since 1990. So it's true. Every few years, this is, what, this is where we are. Um, and I thought I would, this quote was my favorite because it's from Mary Kay Sigety. <laughs> Mary Kay was the um, boundary lines on the Boundary Lines Advisory Committee and to the Board of Education, she said this, when talking about the 13th high school, which we're <laughs> doing today. Um, thinking about the 13th high school, each of our students has the right to a seat in a school that isn't overcrowded within a reasonable distance from his or her home, and you have the responsibility to provide it. So I'm asking you, County Council, you have the responsibility to finally put an end to this cycle of redistricting um, and overcrowding. It's just unacceptable um, to, to think that going, learning in a portable is standard operating procedure is sad. Um, they're unsafe. They present security issues, not to mention, as everyone has said, health issues. And I won't read the two pages of testimony I have on portables. Um, but I just ask, um, as a parent and as the PTAC president, for you to really open your mind and consider this, that we have just keep doing this for decades. It's time to stop. So thank you. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Catronio. Ms. Sigety. Ms. Catronio, don't, please don't, don't go away. Good evening. I actually remember making that testimony. I, I said think, several oh, yeah. other things to them at the same time, including don't build Marriott's Ridge High School. That's not where the students <laughs> need to be. It needs to be in the east. Um, and um, It's just funny that it's at 13th High School. I mean, oh, it, right. it is. But it what I wanted to ask, because you did come in representing this, all of our schools, right? Right, PTAs and I forgot from to all of state our what our position was. Well, I... You made it clear? I As you may recall, I, um, over the summer, I sent a letter of position for the PTAC um, setting capacity limits and also asking that you delay um, the public hearing on this so that we could inform people. And you did, and here they are, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the Board of Education took a position last week, and we voted last Monday to support the Board of Education's position. So we are, in, we are united in our positions. Sorry, that was a little minor detail I forgot. That's so. okay. So. Um, but you represent a variety of schools, and I actually took the time to at least listen to a portion of the board's meeting on the, the end of August, um, where it was stated that 30-some uh, schools, if I recall correctly, are, are, are outside of the board policy of... Um, 90 to, 100, 90 to 110%. And I found it interesting that about an equal number were below and above. Okay. I think it's the ones so, that are above are really above. And I, you know. But that's it, not the question. Okay. Okay. No, I recognize it. I, I, trust me, I've looked at the data. I know sure. the open and close chart. We had to vote on that. I know what it looks like. What I'm really interested in knowing is was there much discussion among the delegates to the PTA Council about the fact that we have an, about an equal number that are below and above, and what were going to be recommendations for utilizing the resources that the county citizens have already put lots of tax dollars into? Right. 
I think redistricting oh. has um, made people afraid that they want to solve this problem. And even if your school is under capacity, they don't want to be the next area that, that's going to go through this. So I think uh, people have just become very engaged in APFO. Uh, I think redistricting has inspired, uh, inspired that. So I think we may not have had half the participants at that meeting because if there wasn't redistricting. And I don't so, know if I'm but, answering your question if I'm going around. Well, go ahead, try. I, mean. so I, I think part of it you know, is, is we understand the issues around the overcrowded schools, but there's also the issue around the undercrowded schools. Mm -hmm. And part of it, you know, and it's coming from a family of educators and a daughter who's going to be one next year. I mean, the other thing is programming. And when you're under capacity, sometimes you can't have all the same offerings as other schools have because of that. So it, was that those types of things discussed at all? No. Okay. Nope. Dr. Ball. When did PTEC first come up with uh, your position? The the original position in Ju I sent an email in June, no July because I wasn't PTAC president then. So mid July I sent our position and it was just capacity at 100 percent, financial mitigation, um, and to delay this hearing. Have you heard from the county executive on any of your positions? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, you all, uh, Ms. Katrina has walked away. I won't ask a question. I'll, I'll make a, a statement that that's sort of in, in line with those things. Now you can't. It's all right. I, I just just that it's. Uh, I appreciate the uh, extent of the the recommendation. No, it's all right. No, it's. Uh, I just I just want to comment. I appreciate the extent of the the recommendations and the, and the thought that went into it. I, I think the the question that my colleagues. Uh, have asked also in terms of whether or not uh, there's a consideration for in relative to schools, since that's your obviously your interest. Yeah, it's then come up, if you're going to if you're going to respond, you're going to have to come all the way up. Sorry, you have to come up. You can't you can't talk from back there. I can talk from here. You can't you can't talk from that there. It has to be on the record there. Yeah, there we go. Yes, and and certainly you have increase in class sizes at the schools that are under capacity. So I just I think people are so um, like I said before, they're really engaged. This redistricting has. No, yes. and, and I, I, so the, the point is, yes, I agree with you, and right. I am quite happy to see the level of engagement, right, because the solutions and the ideas for the solutions don't get generated in vacuums. And they're not uh, easy solutions. They're, no, and, and I appreciate that you're saying that. And so what I, my, my point is that tonight has been helpful, and needless to say, the conversation, even in the, the time between our hearing and the in July to now, uh, because the Board of Education just took their position, right? right. So, um, so these are these are some substantive ideas. Dr. Zhang came up and talked about uh, about the the Rose test. I don't know that anybody's discussed that in the 12, 14 years that have uh, between the last time we, we talked about it, except probably Ms. Tarasa, who she's giving me the evil eye. I've had plenty eye. of conversation about the road test. Right. Well, in, in, in this context, it's part of updating uh, updating AFO. So what I'm what I'm hearing from from uh, from from your organization, from people across the community, is there are a lot of elements here that are now because of redistricting. I'm sure the developers are thrilled that this is all happening at the same right. time. Well, and, I mean, love it. And, 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 well, to be to be fair, there was a, a, a significant effort put forward by that task force, mm -hmm. right? And they poured I don't over discount that. thousands of uh, hours of uh, you know people hours in total of, of data, including uh, the next person who's going to testify. So, um, so I, I just I, I think it's it's interesting in timing. It, it's it's a little it's. We're, we're sort of running up against a, a precipice here in terms of timing, uh, and so I think it's interesting the volume of ideas that are coming at us right now uh, that, that that we have to consider. So. It's just clear that what we've been doing has not worked. No, I appreciate that that perspective. Right? But that's and, not to say that we should just try something new just for the heck of it. So I, mean, it, it, you know. I think to, to that point, I think what I hear you saying is uh, is the, it's 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 worth uh, diving deeper on some of these things that have come up, right? And again, some of these things have. Yeah, and we, I mean, I recently. know the Board of Ed, and I know I've sp spent sure. a lot of time researching, and right. as you can tell, I've got quotes from 2001, so. <laughs> yep, very good. No, I appreciate that. And thank you, thank you for sticking there. I know you had some issues going I, back I, and yeah, out, so I, I appreciate issues. that. Back <laughs> thank in. you. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Diane Butler, and then after uh, Ms. Butler, we have Tanya Lopez, Vipin, uh, Vipin Sahajwani, 
uh, Kupla and Thuryasamy and Michelle Wood. Excuse Good me, e I'm not feeling very well today, but I thought it was so important to come. Well, we I appreciate did. that. We haven't seen you in a bit, so we appreciate you being <laughs> out here. Um, I was one of those people on the task force that went to 23 meetings, and I have a very different viewpoint of what happened on the task force. The task force was set up like the past committees. Unfortunately, what we needed this time was a way to look at how well APFO was working and what else the citizens felt we needed in the APFO. This is not what happened. Every single people that people are testi every single thing that people are testifying about in this room today was discussed and voted down by the developers. The voting procedure was heavily, heavily slanted in favor of the developers, and it totally stymied the committee. The committee members were forced to negotiate and give up things to the developers just to get the 110 percent capacity number. Why, when we should have had a 100 percent capacity number? The police department came. They thought they were in pretty good shape. The fire department came. The fire department had a request. The developers voted it down. On one particular day, the voting process was changed for just that meeting, and the developers voted down any discussion at all on the roads portion of the APFO, one of its main proponents. This, charge, this change was restored back to the old voting process at the next meeting. The setup of the committee was incorrect. This was in no way the county executive's fault. They set it up like we used to do it. It just wasn't what we needed this time around. The committee was set up as it was in the past, but it just didn't work for the citizens. <clears throat> Sorry, I really don't feel well. I have tried over and over again to write testimony for this particular legislation, and I just can't. There were so many excellent suggestions from the committee members, and the developers threw them in the trash. The APFO needs a much better look than it was been given. The citizens of Howard County gave you a mandate in 2002, and that was to have their children go to school in their neighborhood schools and to never split a neighborhood. David Drown did a lot of work to make sure that was going to happen, and that has been, excuse my language, but bastardized through the process, and it isn't working. You need to listen to your citizens. My suggestions are to shelve the legislation. Go back and look at the actual notes from the committee members and rewrite the legislation and put the things in that the citizens of this county are really looking for. Never go over 100% capacity. Find a way. Other counties do. If we have to look at other ways to do things, there are plenty of ways to do that. Listen to the citizens of the county. The next election will be all about the AFO. You may be sure of that. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we do have more people to get through, and these, the, the pauses are going to cause us to uh, not get through everybody. So uh, any questions for us? No, Mr. just I, I was going to say, to be clear, 2002, he did not solve that. I, took, well, I was involved in taking him to court. He didn't solve that in 2002. 2002 is when we started with that particular process. Okay. But, All right. And if you have any questions about these things, I am more than willing to help M you. Ms. Butler, yes. when did it become apparent that the committee makeup was less than ideal? way into the process because we spent tons and tons of hours on education and we brought in um, the committee we had lots and lots of people come to us and educate us because we had people that wanted bike lanes we had people that wanted uh, stormwater management we had people that wanted infill stuff we had people that wanted school stuff so everyone had to be educated and so we brought in the all the people from the county to educate us, and it took months. It took a lot longer, so the process was already stretched out past the time period that it should have been, and that was a really good thing because it brought all these things to the table. We had spreadsheets and spreadsheets of all the suggestions that we had, but getting them passed the way it was set up to have it passed didn't work, and there was a lot of, developer, a lot of developers on there. They showed up to every single meeting. A lot of times some people, like the Board of Education lady, didn't show up if we were talking about roads that day. I mean, she would show up for the school things. but And that became a problem because we had so many citizens on there, and I understand that. But I went to every single meeting that I could, and the one I couldn't, I did over the phone because it was important. And I really was into stormwater management and infill and whatever. But 
there were so many important things that were put on the table that never wrote, just never reached the light of day that you all got to see. And it was really important be because that's what we wanted to see for our county, and it didn't happen. And it was just, you know, Joe Rudder came and set the committee up like they had done in the past, and good for him. But that's almost 20 years ago. We needed this committee to do something else. The committee tried, but we were stymied by the developers every single way because of the way the voting was set up. They were just able to outvote us all the time, and then we would have to go negotiate for it for things that we shouldn't be negotiating for. Do you remember when the committee concluded its work? Oh, I honestly don't. It, it, you know, we were supposed to go for six months, and then we went almost a full year, and um, it was like February or something. I mean, some nights we were there till 1 o'clock in the morning. We just had to go home. I mean, we were just say anything to get out and go home. It reached that point, fighting with the developers, it wasn't worth it. We came up with the great ideas about, you know, changing the schools to, uh, you know, the, the, which school, if this one is impacted and the school is impacted around it, instead of the actual, we now have, sex, you know, separate groupings or whatever. Adjacency I mean, versus They regional, were great right. ideas, and they needed to be looked at, but it got voted down because of this or that, and, and we did have to, you know, look at a lot of things that are not in the ATFO now, um, that should be in the AFO. And so they're saying, well, the AFO doesn't really cover that. We have to go look at that somewhere else. So we started this big parking lot list, and then I didn't see half of that come out on the parking lot list at the very end. And, you know, I have a stack this big to go back through and try and find. But, you know, unfortunately, you know, my daughter had a lot of back problems last year, and I spent a lot of time in Miami instead of going through the AFO stuff to send you updates, which... I will do at any time that you would like, and I'm sure that a lot of the other people on the committee would be happy to do so also. Any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Butler. You're welcome. Tanya Lopez. <laughs> Vipin Sahajwani. Kuplan Thuryasamy. Michelle Wood. Ms. Wood. Nellie Arling uh, Arrington. Denise Eblin. Kimberly Hurst, uh, Edward Wassel. Shall I start? Please. Um, my name is Michelle Wood. Um, I'm here uh, representing the Hickory Ridge Community Association. I'm the chair of the Village Board. Uh, the Hickory Ridge Village Board has been following the discussions about APFO reform very closely. We thank you for tabling the legislation to allow input for more residents and community groups on this important issue. Adequate public facilities are extremely important to our community. It is often stated that the, that new development will bring in additional tax dollars and improve amenities. However, it seems to many lately that our public service departments, including police, fire, and the HCPSS, are being asked to do more with less per capita. It is clear that the current APFO regulations are, well, inadequate. Um, on August 29th, 2017, the Howard County School Board voted to recommend the following include high schools in the schools test, maintain the current open and closed designation language, that schools be designated closed on the open and closed chart at 100% capacity utilization, inclusion of a funding trigger in APFO for school facilities at 95% capacity with a projection of over 110 in five years, and require that all development must pass the schools test. The Hickory Ridge Village Board supports the recommendations of the Howard County School Board. In the event that a cap of 100% would force Howard County to shoulder the entire cost of school construction by eliminating all state funding, then we support the lowest possible threshold that would allow the county to receive state funds. We recognize that other counties in Maryland already include many of these recommendations in their laws, and some even require significantly longer wait times for developers as well. Howard County is an extremely desirable area in which to live. As such, there is no reason for this county to have such relatively weak APFO of regulations and no need to further incentivize development in this area. It is critical for both current and future residents that developers contribute appropriate impact fees and that provisions for adequate services and infrastructures are put in place before additional growth is permitted. Thank you. And on a personal note, speaking for myself only, I just want to thank Richard Cohn for his insightful comments about inclusion and diversity in the school system. Thank you very much. Questions, colleagues? Any questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Harrington. We have uh, Denise Alban, Kimberly Hurst, Ed Wassel, Christy Muma, and Jessica Ciccarelli. Good evening. 
Good evening. I am Nellie Arrington, president of the Mount Hebron Orchards Community Association, representing some 800 northern Ellicott City households spanning west from Route 29 to just past McKenzie Road and north from I-70 to the Howard County line. Our focus is predictability and quality of life for our residents. I was involved in the discussion when APFO was developed in the late 1980s and early 1990s. APFO was created to offer predictability for the developers and builders and lenders willing to invest in our community and create the communities where many of those here tonight now live. First, we support the change of school capacity to 100%, but with the considerations of programming changes, classroom allocations, and the blips of population where one or two class years have a higher population than usual, pushing classes to a temporarily higher size of, say, two to three students going through the schools and thus changing the capacity percentages. Second, we support adding high schools to the capacity test, and we are aware that earlier this evening, uh, County Executive Kittleman did advance uh, earlier funding for the 13th high school, identify another potential site, and ask to delay the redistricting for the high school areas until that high school is built. But excluding high schools from the process has resulted in poor planning. An example is a recent proposal to move one Mount Hebron polygon, neighborhood polygon where the students currently walk to Mount Hebron to Marriott's Ridge High School, requiring those students to be bused literally past the edge of the Mount Hebron campus to a school seven miles away. This makes no sense. Third, we ask that county planners and decision makers communicate more with the state, colleagues, especially when it comes to roads. Our area is bisected by Route 99, a state road that takes the overflow from I-70 backups daily while serving the extended developments in the Northern County Corridor. It's been difficult for us to work with this because our neighborhood roads, which are county owned, intersect with state roads, although we have had wonderful communication with state roads planners. Fourth, we ask that the county find and use a predictive model that takes into account the natural growth and transitions of existing neighborhoods. Many of our areas are reaching a natural turnover age where long-term owners sell and the new owners have students coming into the schools and more vehicle trips on the roads. It's one thing to count noses from new houses, but, and I first said this in a public session at the advent of APFO, there is no requirement to live in a new house to procreate successfully. <laughs> we need to consider this influx of students and drivers and users of other county services as we move forward to predict what we need to maintain our quality of life. Finally, this can't be an adversarial process between residents and the business community. It just can't. It's time for that to be over. Our residents, however, need the accountability and predictability as planning, growth, and redevelopment go forward in respect for the investments we all have made in our choice to live here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Arrington. And uh, don't go away. There, we have a couple of questions for you. Just real quick, yes. folks, we're going to, we need to take a break after uh, we have a couple of questions here because we have mm -hmm. to reset our system here. Um, but uh, just real quick, so I was going to say, uh, after five hours uh, this evening, you did get line of the night. I doubt anybody's going to top you. <laughs> we try. <laughs> That's, that's, a, that's a Mount Hebron personality thing. We, we work with calm and a sense of humor to get our point over. Okay. Well, Ms. Arrington, so along your line of the night, yes. <laughs> in, in relation to um, our older housing stock, mm -hmm. um, you've certainly been active in selling real estate and, and yes. you know, in uh, helping people come to Howard County for a mm -hmm. long time. 
So we have heard through this that a um, that we are being asked to look at yet again an increase to the transfer tax. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on that? I can give that to you professionally, not as president of the community association. Correct, and, and I know that. Um, and I will tell you that the total transfer tax in Howard County, including the state, uh, state is a half percent, the county transfer and recordation totals 1.5%. It totals 2%. And in a county where our average house, when you include all types of housing stock, is probably just above $400,000. Uh, that is $4,000. And it is a concern, it is an issue for the affordability in Howard County. When we start to go up, on transfer taxes. Um, we start to lose people. We start to lose those first time buyers. Those are my kids. Those are my friends, my, their, their friends. Um, those are folks who are important to have in this county as our mix. Uh, they are kids who grew up here. They also have an investment in this community and they wanna come back home and they wanna live here. So. I would have a huge issue with raising the transfer taxes as it relates to the affordability, the diversity, and the right of our children to not only go to school here, but to come home and live here and have their children come here. So I think that's really interesting because if in fact the statistics that we're currently seeing are correct and I have no reason to doubt that they aren't since they've been put together mm -hmm. by the Office of School Planning along with our Department of Planning and Zoning that we are seeing more than 50 percent now I think at 58 percent mm -hmm. and who knows what this year will tell us of the new group of the the increase in students coming from resales what you're saying is folks who buy new houses end up paying additionally because of a developer fee, but people who come into the community and buy a resale house don't have any investment in providing adequate public facilities? That's an interesting, different take on it, Ms. Sigety. I don't know that I've ever honestly thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my own I'm feeling is that with with the the you know housing stock in Howard County has a premium to it on resale just the way it does on new construction. If you go into frankly Baltimore County and Catonsville area, excellent schools in that area, but you look at a similar house as in Mount Hebron, I'm probably going to pay about $50,000 less for it. In Catonsville? In Catonsville. Right. And I think that's the key. I think you are paying a premium to be in Howard County. If you look at the statistics of average house price. You know, I've lived in my house since December of 1980. I'm a native of Howard County. The, probably one of the few you'll have here tonight. True native. Families. Generations. I've not moved. My house has been assigned to five different elementary schools. When I first moved in, it was Rockland, now the Arts Center. Then it was St. John's Lane. Then we opened Waverly. Then we opened Hollifield. Then we went back to St. John's Lane. And now that infamous polygon I mentioned, part of our neighborhood is back at Waverly. Not mine, but part of it. I didn't go anywhere. So I understand that. There, there are certainly many people probably in this room as well mm -hmm. as in the county who've had a mm -hmm. similar history. But that doesn't really get to the point that I think we actually need to have a robust conversation about, mm -hmm. which is why 
our housing price, well, I think that we know why our housing prices are higher than other places, mm -hmm. and one of the major drivers is the quality of our schools. Exactly. And so if it is indeed the quality of our schools, I think, I personally think, mm -hmm. that we all have an obligation to support them. So when I sell my house, my portion of the trance, mm -hmm. I should have to pay because I have been a beneficiary of a county with a strong school system and appreciating values over time. Just like if I were to move in with children, I should expect to think about how do I contribute so that my children will get a good education. And so when I look at it, I'm just going to, uh, we'll stop now because we mm -hmm. need to stop. Yeah. But I wanted to say it out loud tonight because I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of how do we look at the folks who want to be in the county and then who want to leave the county in this buying and selling situation and figure out what is an equitable contribution to what this county has given to them for the folks who are leaving and what this county will likely give to folks who are coming in. So just a conversation that I think we need to have. And here you were mm. as a realtor, and I know that that's an important <laughs> conversation. That's fine. So we've at least had a little bit of it, and you can let them know that I, for one, am interested in, in talking about it. All right. It. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I believe you meant 8,000 before. Mm -hmm. When you're doing yeah, the math before, you made 8,000. Well, we don't need to yes, the except this. that in, At 11 o'clock at night, it, she gets a pass. Yeah, in the, no, no, I just want to no, in, the cost, in the customary transaction, in the customary transaction, that 2% yeah. right. is split 50-50. Right. Right. That's right. why it's but a 4,000. 4,000 each. Right. Right. No, I gotcha. understand that yeah. part of it, too, but just for others who may not have to. Very good. So we, we need to take a break to re reset our system. Folks, at the very beginning, those of you who have been here with us all night, God bless you. Uh, but also, uh, we uh, said we were going to break at midnight. We will not get through the entire list. Uh, as I said at the beginning of the evening, uh, those folks who we do not get to this evening, uh, we will pick up right after uh, the conclusion of public hearing uh, hearing testimony uh, from the public on all other legislation that's before us on September 18th. No. And um, and then the uh, other uh, option, obviously, is if uh, if you cannot make that, then submitting your testimony electronically is always uh, always an option. So I uh, just want to let you know. So we're going to take a quick break so we can reset our system, and then we're going to go for another hour. Thank you. <laughs> You're next. <laughs> then Edward Wa Wassell or Wassell, Christy Muma, and Jessica Ciccarelli. So, um, and so, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Rumberley, can you can you close the doors? Uh, thank you. Oh, the officer has it. Who knows? We might okay. get lucky. Good evening. My name is Denise Eblin. I live at 6317 Saddle Drive, Columbia, Maryland. I testify today as a 15-year resident of Howard County, a taxpayer with two kids in the public school system. When I moved to Howard County, I came here to settle and build a family, as many thousands have before and since, and I was excited, I'm excited to be part of a community that prizes economic and social diversity. In the years since, I've often thanked my stars for the good fortune that led me here. Columbia has just celebrated its 50th anniversary, and we look forward to 50 more great years. Elected officials, such as yourselves, come and go, and each are charged with shepherding this community, this county of ours, through inevitable economic and social changes. Over the past several years, Howard County has fared well in terms of economic progress, particularly in comparison to the rest of the country in the wake of the Great Recession. However, we're now facing a significant social upheaval with, again, um, with school overcrowding, discussions on school redistricting for the second time in less than five years. Recall what it is that makes Howard County a great place to live an attractive destination for families that regularly ranks at the top of nationwide best places to live lists. It's our schools, our parks, our public facilities, our low unemployment, healthy home prices, and economic opportunities. Bills like APFO are central to assuring the continued vibrancy of Howard County, so long as they strive to strike the balance between economic gains and social concerns, which with as much foresight as possible. Setting the parameters of APFO may seem like minutia or bureaucracy, but it can have very significant repercussions on whole communities. So I'll leave you with this one ask, please. 
put the concerns of Howard County families front and centre when setting the parameters for APFO. Create a vision to include the capacity for schools, roads and other infrastructure to meet the likely needs over the coming decades. Balance this against the economic health of the community. Do what's right for taxpayers, voters and for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody, uh, questions? No. Thank you very much. So that was my alarm to warn everybody that we're coming toward the end of the evening. Um, so I have to turn that off because I just hit snooze instead of turning it off. So, <laughs> so I, I, I will take this uh, awkward pause to let people know. Uh, so we are scheduled to start at 6 o'clock next uh, week. Typically our start time is 7 o'clock. We did that so that uh, we can get through the other uh, testimony on the earlier side. So what we're planning to do is start with the testimony that we do not hear tonight at 7 o'clock uh, next, uh, next week. Uh, and, uh, and so we will... At 7 o'clock? So, 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 so 6 o'clock is when we are starting our regular, our regular stuff and we're starting earlier. But what we're saying is we're going to start this. If there's anybody who still hasn't testified at the end of the night, start that at 7. So you have a known time since we were worried so about you, everybody having been out twice already late to give you some certainty. <laughs> Did you like how I threw my voice? <laughs> you, Do you like how we have a similar voice? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's the intent. So we give you a certain start time as opposed to have you at 6 and wait till we get through our rest of our testimony. So, okay, so with that... Uh, uh, Kimberly Hurst, thank you. And we have uh, Christy Muma, Jessica, Jessica Ciccarelli, okay, uh, Zachary Rose, and Chow Wu. Good morning. Good. Well, not, not quite, quite yet. but we're close, right? Um, my name's Kimberly Hurst. I live at 5904 Northern Court in Elkridge. And my family and I have had the pleasure of being Howard County residents for about 15 years. We love Howard County, and we moved here for many reasons, but one of them was our great schools. Unfortunately, it's that very school system that has us right now questioning Howard County and if we are actually placing the needs of our children and the citizens in, uh, before that of the developers. My children attend Howard High School. It's a great school. We love it. But have you guys driven to Howard High School in the morning? It's like going to a Meriwether concert. It is crazy. You can't go anywhere. It's all jammed up. And when you leave a uh, night, you know, we had back to school night the other day. It was like leaving the Raven Stadium. It's just there's too many people. And um, I don't know what to do about it. I was trying to figure out what's, what's the safety valve to prevent this, which we know is the APFO, and we know we need to amend that. Um, the redistricting at the high school level, I agree, is a Band-Aid approach. I do not think we should do it. I think it disrupts the lives of thousands of children in their most formative years. And I do agree with getting a new high school um, online. So if that actually does happen, that's thrilling, and I, and I hope it does happen. Um, but now we need to make sure that we fix the APFO and prevent these problems from continuing to happen. So we need to balance the growth. And unfortunately, I don't think Council Bill 61 goes far enough. I'm asking you to please amend Council Bill 61 with the following provisions. Set school capacity limits at 100% and include high schools. I, everyone said it. I don't need to say more. 100% is, is at capacity. Um, mitigation should start when schools reach 95% capacity so that we are planning for a full school and we know what to do instead of being um, reactive we need to start being proactive and um, we need to raise the impact fees I know this has come up and one of the builders wasn't sure um, where we stood but 2400 for Howard County is the lowest around I mean I think Arundel's 15,000 Montgomery might be 26,000 why is Howard County selling itself so cheap um, and putting more burden on our taxpayers so I'm going to be positive and I'm going to say Thank you for building a new high school, and thank you for amending Council Bill 61. And I'm going to end with a quote from the superintendent that I read in a paper this week that I thought kind of wrapped this all up for me. He said, we need to lead with our hearts and put the needs of our students first. And I'm asking you to do just that. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Any questions? No. Great. Thank you. Uh, Zachary Rose, Chow Wu, Nancy Patrone. And uh, uh, Lena, uh, no, I, I called his name four times. 
Uh, Lena uh, Kennedy or Arena Kennedy? I can't, can't tell. I just crossed out over it. Sir. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Zach Rose, and my wife and I have been residents of Howard County for 17 years. We reside at 4500 Choose Terrace in Ellicott City, Maryland, 21043. We have two lovely children, both at Ellicott Mills Middle School. I have never testified previously. My objective is to speak on behalf of a singular position, that all APFO legislation must specify that the threshold for action is 100% school capacity and that 100% of schools, including high schools, be included in this legislation consideration. I understand that most government law, there are nuances, such as defining a small versus a large, two years versus a four years, and making, quote, grand compromises. But I propose that school capacity is specific, and I ask that you respect the work done by those to define capacity as it relates to schools. From the 2016 feasibility study on page 14, I quote, equitable evaluation of the impact of projected enrollment growth requires calculation of the capacities of schools. Capacities are not necessarily fixed to the capacity designed when a building first opened. Changes in use, program, and standards can effectively change capacity. Capacity methodologies have been reviewed at all three levels in recent years. In other words, many qualified individuals worked as a team to define and actively refine the capacity for each school, including making amendments for use and changes in standards. But after that, we must respect this analysis. For anyone to advocate for anything but 100% of this calculation per school is inserting a personal judgment and allowing it to supersede carefully considered metrics. I call out two examples from tonight. First is to try to redefine capacity using, quote, different modes. Second is to try to challenge the school-by-school -school capacity in favor of a county-wide capacity. I am not naive. We all daily go beyond what is suggested, driving 60 in a 55, or as I wrote here, surely eating food after the expiration date. And when considering legislation, I understand that the county council must balance the needs and desires of many various constituents and external parties. But when it comes to the APFO, we must respect the work of those who use their expertise to define and document school capacity. Simply put, if we want to increase capacity, take the time, gather the funding, and actually increase the capacity. Don't ignore this threshold. Anything but 100% is inadequate. Choosing to go above 100% has incredibly poor effects on the community. Consider safety at the top of this list. Within the context of schools only, we have kids riding in aisles on school buses and walking to insecure portables just to name two specific concerns. I wish I had more time to go on. Finally, consider time. If you add up the opportunity cost of all of this time, imagine what all that time could do if we put that effort somewhere besides here and the heartbreaking discussion on redistricting. Tonight, I've given my maximum effort I can, and that maximum is 100%. Thank you for hearing my testimony. Thank you, sir. Good question. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Pleasure seeing you all. Thank you. So I'm going to read off uh, uh, the next 10 or so names. Uh, and so uh, if uh, <laughs> it, that we're, we think we should be able to get to in the next 40 minutes. So Chow Wu, uh, Nancy Patron, uh, Lena or Aina Kennedy, Jennifer Spiegel, Christy Camo, Paul Scott, Michael Wilson, and uh, Laura uh, Ramey. Lori Ramey, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes. Hi, good evening, Chairman Weinstein and our council members. I think I met a lot of developers who show up in our village board and our Columbia Association board. I live in 5720 Whistling Winds Walk, Clarksville, 21029. I'm a board member of River Hill Village Board and the Columbia Association Board. So I come with some developers who spoke today so that we are, who oppose this current APFO, we're unhappy residents. I think we're not probably a little unhappy, but I really were I really advocating for our children, for the school system, especially because of this large scale redistricting. We just need a common sense solution and uh, capacity is an issue and we need to solve it as soon as possible. Otherwise, large scale redistricting will come back again I think last time when the county council passed legislation for downtown for about 20,000 new people in the last 30 years, we only planned for one elementary school. That's the problem. I didn't see APFO apply that correctly. And I wrote that 
an article on the River Hill Village Board and the villager. And so I think I will talk about three loopholes and two numbers. The first loophole is the high school is not included in the school capacity limit test. So that's not wrong. Why high school is accepted? So we should include that. The other loophole is waiting time. When one development didn't pass the test and then after waiting several years, it automatically passed. That's a loophole. And we already talk about loophole. That's the second loophole. The third loophole is median and low income housing capacity. So whenever we set 2,000 units per year and there, we are setting 15% medium and low income housing, and that's 300 units. That 300 units is not included in the total cap. We should include that cap in the total unit allowed to, for development per year. And I would talk about two numbers. The first number is very important. I would like, we set the capacity at 100%. If we set a 115%, it's like leaking water. When we see water is leaking, what will we do first? We're closing the faucet first. So the unregulated, unplanned development is the problem. We should focus on that. That's the reason we want to focus on the APFO. Another number we are talking about is for 2,000 square feet house, Montgomery County charged 25,000, 25,000, Prince George County, 15,000, Frederick County, 14,000, Howard County, $2.4 thousand dollars. Thank you, sir. Unbelievable low. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wu. <laughs> Nancy Patron. Do you have any questions? Uh, any questions? Oh, thank you. I think she was just Jessica Ciccarelli. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Ciccarelli. My, my, my bad. Good evening. Thank you for hearing all of us concerned citizens tonight. Uh, my name is Jessica Ciccarelli, and my family lives at 6314 Monterey Road in Elkridge. We have four children going through the Howard County school system. I'm testifying tonight because I'm worried that if the county doesn't do a better job controlling and planning for development, the schools will continue this redistricting process every two to three years, and our children and communities will suffer. There are better ways to manage the population growth in our county that benefit the citizens that you serve. I'm concerned about the school seat increases in Howard County, especially the high schools, the lack of process or plan to mitigate the current enrollment levels. As you know, Howard High is about 140% capacity. How could our children be provided with a safe and effective learning environment when our school is 40% above maximum capacity and maximum capacity is 100% in all math, including Common Core math? <laughs> Classrooms are overcrowded and mobile trailers are being used to mitigate the environment. I'm requesting that Council Bill 61 be amended with the following provisions to more fairly and equitably balance well-planned growth and effective mitigation for our public infrastructure. School capacity limits, including high schools, to be set at 100% and schools are closed to new development at or above that level. Even at the proposal of 110 capacity does not make our children and their education the top priority. If developers can play, pay double or triple the surcharge to continue development with no regard to capacity levels. This proposal clearly sides with the developers in still keeping their fee at a comfortable and accessible rate to the detriment of our schools and our children. Triple the surcharge rate for up to 120% is still less than or equal to the initial fee of three of the biggest counties in the state and fails to properly address the ongoing capacity problems. According to the APFO Review Task Force Master Vote Tally, the task force voted to keep capacities at 110 to 120% because the county is dependent on the revenue generated by the public school surcharge. Is this the goal of the task force, to prioritize surcharge revenue over the educational environment of Howard County students? And if that were the goal, why so cheap? Mitigation must begin when schools reach 95% capacity, otherwise you're being reactive versus proactive. As Benjamin Franklin once said, when you fail to plan, you, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. This is an important issue, and if the county officials don't make lasting, meaningful changes, 
These important issues to the voting citizens will continue to plague our county every year. And there's one thing in all of this that I would request to exceed 100%, and that's the effort and attention our elected county officials give to our citizens in making lasting changes that benefit the future of Howard County. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ciccarelli. Questions? Great, thank you. Okay, Nancy Patron. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Nancy Patron, and I reside at 9601 Hall Court, Ellicott City. I have two children, both of whom attend Waverly Elementary. According to the 2017 feasibility study, enrollment for our school is 684. It isn't. It is 771. Capacity following the completion of the school's addition is 738. Our student population already exceeds capacity inclusive of the new addition before it is even completed. That means that when we accept the proposed 143 additional students next year, we will open our doors at over 120% capacity on day one. Do you see a problem? The County Council has done a remarkable job of sidestepping responsibility for overcrowded schools. But as is usually the case, in the end, one need only follow the money to understand that school overcrowding and redistricting are merely symptoms of a much larger problem, in this case, an extremely weak APFO. The Howard County School District is among the best in the nation. It is not surprising that over 50% of our schools exceed state-rated capacity of 100%. What is surprising is that the county's APFO school capacity threshold of 115% is among the highest in the state. Accord adding insult to injury, because construction of schools has not kept pace with development, the only option available to address overcrowding is to continually shift students west. Equalizing capacity across the county only further exacerbates the problem by artificially lowering school capacities and once again opening up school districts to development, which inevitably results in more overcrowding and yet another round of redistricting. School capacity limits, including high schools, must be set at 100% with school districts closed to development at that level. We also need to increase the maximum wait times while freezing new project developments until adequate infrastructure is in place. As for mitigation efforts in the form of funding, additional time, or both, they must begin when a school reaches 95% capacity and school capacity thresholds must be unbundled from mitigation fees. Allowing developers to move forward if projected enrollment reaches levels of up to 120% by paying a public, facilities, a public school facility surcharge of double or triple the amount in the current law will do nothing to alleviate overcrowding. Howard County surcharges are ridiculously low, embarrassingly low, in comparison to numbers, neighboring counties as well as a pittance of what it costs to add a new seat to a Howard County school. Triple of nominal is still a steal. Taxpayers will continue to subsidize the new residential development that creates overcrowding in schools and then pay again for the solution. This insanity has got to stop. If Howard County is to remain a desirable place to live and work, the county's APFO must be strengthened to ensure that infrastructure keeps pace with growth. It should be reviewed every four years. The county council is supposed to represent the interests of constituents, Thank not you. development. Thank developers, you. rather. We are watching and we vote. Thank, Thank you. you. Any questions? I have uh, Lena Kennedy, Jennifer Spiegel, Christy Camo, Paul Scott, Michael Wilson, Lori Ramey. Hi. I'm Jennifer Spiegel. I am at 12475 Triadelphia Road. That's in Ellicott City on the far western side, 21042. I'm here tonight to advocate for stronger AFO as it relates to our schools. I have lived in Howard County for over 17 years and have seen firsthand how development has taken a toll on our county infrastructure, resulting in more traffic on our roads and overcrowding in the schools. The current AFO bill, as proposed by County Executive Kittleman, is lacking and needs to be stronger now to fix the current situation in our schools. Current AFO must be strengthened to secure the future of our county. We have a nationally ranked and really highly respected school system. The overcrowding conditions cannot continue as our students and teachers pay the price. Large class sizes, not enough textbooks or computers, 
Hallways so crowded that students are late to classes and portables being used as long-term solutions. We are better than this. Our elected officials must do better than this. I urge the county council to consider the legacy you are leaving this county. We should be able to look at our county infrastructure with pride knowing that we have taken the right steps to ensure our schools are a place where every child can learn with the needed space and resources. A responsible county council should ensure a dedicated revenue stream to support our schools with developers being that primary source. A responsible county council should take a long, hard look at the state of our overcrowded schools and put the best interest of our children first, not developers. A responsible county council should recognize that having strong ATFO in place is the mechanism for creating a desirable place to live. We want 100% school capacity, including our high schools, mitigation to begin at 95% capacity, no reduction to current wait times for development, increase the real estate transfer fee by 1%, and AFO to be reviewed every four years. Make no mistake, our schools are in a dire situation. We are behind the eight ball in controlling the overdevelopment that results in schools overcrowding. We must take the necessary steps now to stop the downward spiral. The County Council, DPZ, and Board of Education must work together on a process for better planning and communication. And we need funding for High School 13 in the 2019 capital budget now. I'm not anti-development. I am for responsible growth. But our schools and children come first, and they are at risk from years of unchecked overdevelopment. The County Executive and County Council were elected by us to represent us. We are here telling you what we want for this county. We can and must do better. Our elected officials can and must do better. Our children deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. Christy Camo. And we have uh, Paul Scott, uh, Michael Wilson, Lori Ramey, Prabhusha Chandra Shiskaran, and Srinivas Chinamani. My name is Christy Camo. Uh, I live at 6460 Julianne Drive in Hanover. Uh, I have a fourth and a sixth grader in the Howard County School System. My husband and I are both computer scientists and do not speak in public, much less testify at public hearings. <laughs> this is hard for me, but the children of Howard County are worth it. All of the children of Howard County are worth it. I didn't realize that I needed to testify until Thursday night when I gave my PTAC report to my local elementary school, PTA. I finally found my voice. I urge you to vote against CB61 and 62 in their current state. It does nothing to slow the residential growth or the overcrowded enrollments that we are seeing in Howard County. We need all development to pass school tests. If schools are over the open close number, then construction may not proceed. There should not be a timetable associated with the construction. The open close capacity should be close to 100%, not 115. That number is just too high. High schools must be included in these assessments. We need all schools represented. Some of our high schools are our biggest overcrowding problem right now. The impact surcharge fees per home are too low in Howard County, especially compared to our neighboring counties. Our app for problems are causing our schools to be overcrowded, resulting in large class sizes and the use of portables, which were supposed to be temporary. The safety guidelines for portables do not, sorry, the safety guidelines for portables do not meet the safety guidelines for the rest of the school. One morning, my third grade daughter was coming into school for the day. She was told by a well-meaning teacher to take her instrument outside to the band portable so that she didn't have to carry it downstairs. What the teacher didn't consider was that my daughter, once my daughter dropped the instrument off in the portable out back, there was no way for her to get back into the school through the back door. She knocked and knocked, but no one heard her. She walked along the path next to the woods to get back to the front of the school, but she was now late for her first class. Another teacher told her out the window she was late in a hurry. They didn't know she'd been locked out of the school. By the time she got back to the front of the school, she was crying and scared. After telling this story, I've heard many stories of going to the bathroom or other ways kids have been locked out on their way to the, um, in the county because of the portables. This is a safety issue. I expect my kids walk in the front door of their school. I can assume some level of assurance that they will not be locked out of that school. My husband and I explained to our children tonight why I wouldn't be home for dinner and for reading books. We explained that sometimes you have to do the hard thing. This was a hard thing for me. 
We need you to do the hard thing for the children of Howard County and vote against CD 61 and 62. Thank you. Paul Scott. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try a couple. I know I'm butchering some of the names, so I apologize. Uh, uh, Lori Ramey uh, Prabhusha, Chandra Seskarankanar, sorry, uh, Srinivas Chenaman, Chenamanini, and Hongling Zhu, Veena uh, Rad, uh, Radhakrishnan. Mr. Scott. Hey, good evening. My name is Paul Scott. I live at 6401 South Wind Circle in Columbia. Uh, I've been a resident of Howard County for about 14 years, and I'm here at this late hour um, to support my two children who are in the Howard County Schools as well as all the children in our schools. Um, I'm testifying tonight against these two bills, uh, 60, uh, CB 61 and 62, as currently proposed. As you know, the Howard County spends approximately two-thirds of its um, general fund budget on the school system. The level of support has made Howard County Public Schools the best in the state of Maryland and one of the best in the country. Many families, including my own, moved here to Howard County to ensure that our children received a high quality education. I believe, however, that whenever the County Council considers any new legislation that will impact the school system, the, county, the Council needs to ensure that its actions do not adversely affect the schools or the quality of the education that they provide. I believe that the two current bills, as currently drafted, will adversely affect our county schools. Um, these bills can, will continue to result in overcrowded schools in many areas of the county, which leads to the adverse effects on the student communities at these schools as well as on their safety. The bills as currently drafted will result in the need for continual redistricting to address overcrowding with all the attendant stress and disruption that, that, that we're seeing right now. Um, the bills as currently drafted will ensure that portable classrooms will have to be used by students daily. Uh, we just heard a very moving account of what that what can happen there. Um, as others have said, the classrooms have less than ideal heating, cooling, and air quality. There are no bathrooms. They have safety and security issues. Many parents, myself included, are justifiably, justifiably upset that our children have to go to classes in these portable, quote, temporary facilities, um, given the fact that we supposedly have a great school system. Um, I'm here to support changes to the amendments to CB61 as proposed by both the PTA Council of Howard County and the uh, Howard County Board of Education to include um, including high schools in uh, capacity in the formula to determine development, changing the open closed chart capacity to be no more than 100%, um, including a funding trigger to take place at 95%. And as an aside, it was really eye-opening to hear how little developers have to pay and I would fully support that needing to be increased to commensurate with what other counties require. Um, ensuring that all development must pass a school test and the school wait period not be on the sliding scale. Um, I guess in closing, I believe that these changes will improve the current bill, ensure that the quality of our children's education is the primary determinant, um, not the needs of the developers, not the needs of the builders, but the quality of our children's education which should be the prime determinant for, um, for the current APVO legislation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Questions? Okay. Uh, Prabhusha Chandra, I'm sorry, I'm going to really mess this up. Chandra Skarankar? If that's you, sir, then. I know nothing. Very good. That was pretty good, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you okay? Serena Voss. Michael yeah. Wilson's not here. No, I've, I've looked in the audience. He's not, he's not here anymore. And Lori Ramey. Yeah, no, they've called them a few times. Yeah. Okay. So, Serena Voss. Okay, thank you. Good evening, all. This is uh, Dr. Srinivas uh, Chanamaneni. So I live in uh, 8782. My address is Ellicott City, MD21042. I'm a straight shooter, but I'm not going to shoot any bullets. So I only shoot medicines because I'm a pharmacist by profession. And uh, here, the, I studied a lot regarding APFO. And uh, to be honest, uh, APFO had uh, 
a real big problem in its grassroots, and I wish I had a medicine for that. And I live in a community where the last couple of homes are still being built. The community is not even finished. And uh, our community is being redistricted. So my question to you is, when you see the open closed chart, when you allocate housing units, what did you do then? So at that time, like when the community was given the permission, we checked the historical data for elementary, middle, and high school, all were above 110% utilization rate. So, but you still approved that community with 93 housing units. And we don't know what the builder submitted to you. So maybe with uh, zero kids per household. So uh, that's what the, uh, uh, the developer uh, submitted to you. So here, I use a specific word, quote unquote, builders win and our kids lose. And here I would like to point out, so the BOE and also the hard county planning and zoning needs to work in tandem in developing and receiving, exchanging open closed charts. So which are the clue, uh, schools that are available for enrollment and which are the schools are not, at least in the preliminary phase and during the construction phase and also towards the end of the construction. So our community is not even, uh, like uh, the construction is not finished and you are redistricting. So that means you are openly admitting, yes, we have made a mistake. So being a researcher, I'll honestly tell, everybody makes mistakes, yes. Here, you guys screwed up, and there is no shame in admitting, yes, we screwed Thank up, you, sir. but let I, us give a chance to correct it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hong Lin Zhu. And then uh, after uh, Ms. Zhu, we have uh, Veena uh, Radhakrishnan, Joan Nutzel, Caroline Bodziak, Douglas Perkins. Oh, she already spoke. She was one of the first. Hmm? Which one? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Evening. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Hong Lin Zhou. I reside at uh, 7065 River Oak Court, Clarksville. I'm vice president of the Chinese American Parent Association of Howard County. I also serve as a PTA delegate for the Pointers Run Elementary School. Today I'm speaking on behalf of Kappa HC. I come before you today as the HCPSS community is going through a traumatic redistricting process. The process is literally tearing our community apart. Polygon is a math concept. Now everyone is learning the new meaning of the word. No matter how, how the f final plan is, no one is winning if our community is broken. Although APA4 does not mandate redistricting, it can influence growth patterns that eventually could make redistricting happen again. The fact remains that the APA4 in its current form is not effective in preventing school overcapacity. We need a strengthened APA4 to prevent from the necessity of redistricting every a few years. The school test is one of the three APA4 tests. As the, legis as, as the legislation stands now, in order to pass this test, the elementary and middle school districts and the elementary school region serving the proposed development must all be below 115 of 
capacity utilization. Schools that are brought below the 115% for elementary and middle schools will be considered open or available to accommodate new development projects. So first of all, high schools are noticeably missing from the school test. As we are all aware now, the high school redistricting is actually the most contentious part of the process. And all schools are subject to redistricting in 2017 in order to balance adjacent school populations that operate over capacity. So any overcapacity school, particularly high school, could affect all other schools. Secondly, policy 6010 is what the HCPSS uses to adjust attendance boundary. The current target utilization in policy 6010 is enrollment between 90% and the 110% utilization for the program capacity of a school facility. Now, I'm a statistician. I'm having a hard time matching the 115% capacity utilization limit in APA4 and the 90 to 110% utilization in policy 6010. To me, we would have to go through the redistricting every year if both the policies are followed through. Third, in current legislation, if a project does not pass this test, the school test, then plans for the redevelop redevelopment will be placed on hold. But projects can be only, be only be on hold due to failing the school test for, uh, for no more than four years. In other words, the project can begin to build once the time limit is passed. This limit of wait time must be eliminated. All developments should be required to pass the school test period. In order to protect our families from going through the traumatic redistricting process again in short time, the Chinese American Parents Association of Howard County urges the council to implement the following changes to IPA4 that are directly related to schools. One, change the proposed 15% capacity utilization to a 100% in the school test. Two, add high school or high school region in the school test of the APFO. Three, require all development pass the school test. No projects should be granted exemption from the school test. Four, please use the capacity definition in APA4 that is consistent with HCPSS definition. So there is no ambiguity in implementation of the policies. The council members, please do what is best for your constituents and our children, not for the developers. Thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. What school did you say? Can you just tell um, me what school? Pointers Run Elementary School. Pointers Run, okay, thank you. Okay. Vina Radhakrishnan, Joan Nutzel. Good evening, Joan Nutzel, 3505 Fawn Hill Drive, Elgut City. I have been a Howard County resident for the last 18 years and a nurse at Mercy Medical Center in Baltimore City for the last 21 years. Over the years, I have seen many changes in Howard County. My concern is that we are not choosing responsible growth, and if Howard County was a patient, I would say he is dying a slow and painful death as he internally hemorrhages and every major, major or, organ is strangled due to the lack of oxygen, or in this case, inadequate public facility ordinances. As I have mentioned, the last 18 years, I have commuted to Baltimore City. Initially, my commute was an easy 15-mile drive straight down Route 40, 35 minutes door to door. My commute to work remains easy. After all, I leave my house at 6.40 a.m. You know us nurses. But in the last five years, to drive home has become a nightmare. I leave at 4.40 and plan on the commute taking a solid hour. Leaving Baltimore City is relatively simple until I encounter Howard County traffic. From the intersection of Route 40 and Normandy Shop Center Drive until I turn left on St. John's Lane, I can sit in traffic for 15 to 20 minutes to travel approximately two miles. This is ridiculous, and yet I see it only getting worse as more developments pop up, adding more cars to already congested highways and byways. 
Route 40 has become the coastal highway of Howard County. Additionally, my daughters attend Centennial High School and Burley Manor Middle School. Both suffer from overcrowding. My older daughter states that the Centennial is so overcrowded this year that it's difficult to make the classes on time. My younger daughter reports that the middle school is also overcrowded and that personnel has de designated one way in order to help alleviate traffic jams in the hallways. Presently, BMMS is 200 students over its original capacity of 650 students. And in 2018, CHS is projected to be at 122.9%. Mr. Weinstein, I have a question for you. At the beginning of the meeting, you stated that once all the seats were taken, no more people were allowed in the room. Why isn't this true for our schools? Why do we continue to allow people, students, who have every right to be there, but because the capacity is set at 115%, instead of 100%, the schools become overcrowded? Mr. Kittleman has been visiting, and Mr. Weinstein, you have also been visiting the schools. Did you happen to notice how crowded Long Reach High School is at a capacity of 118%? Or at Howard, County, Howard High School, the capacity this year is 130%, and students trying to fit in the cafeteria to eat at the allotted time. Not only is this now become uncomfortable, but it has become a safety issue as well. Change APF now. No delay or referral. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We have the rest of your testimony as well. All right, uh, last couple of folks, if we can get them in here. Caroline uh, Bodziak, is Caroline here? Douglas Perkins. Okay, I'm gonna call a couple more names and see if uh, Laura uh, Wisely. Ms. Wisely, are you here? Okay. Okay, very good. So Ms. Wisely will be our last uh, speaker for the evening. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Perkins? Uh, good evening, and thank you for hosting us this evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Douglas Perkins, and I live at uh, 10613 Vista Road, Columbia, 21044. And I'm going to be broaching an issue that I have not heard anybody broach yet this evening. <clears throat> I have lived in uh, Howard County since 1976, 41 years. And I've resided on Vista Road for the last 29. 28 of those 41 years, I paid taxes in the county and had no children in the school system. When I bought my current residence 29 years ago, I did so with the understanding that it was zoned R20 and that I was permitted to subdivide that one plus acre lot into two half acre lots and develop the second lot. Lo, these last 29 years, that was my, in my consideration as a, uh, an advantage for retirement investment. As I am now at an age and I'm considering taking advantage of that investment, I learn that some people in this county are intent upon stripping that right away from me or putting such constraints on my exercising that right that I might not be able to see the benefit of that in my lifetime. My neighbors have been taking advantage of this right of subdivision for a number of years now, all around me. What had been one acre lots are now half acre lots. Across the street from me are now nine houses on half acre lots. On my side, to my right and my left, there are six houses on half acre lots. And they are in the process of building onto the half acre lots that have been carved out in the one acre lots behind me. I am about to be the only one acre lot in my section of the world. I understand that the bill as proposed would increase the allocation of infill subdividing in the established neighborhoods, which is what I am. I also understand that you've been receiving testimony proposing in, uh, to instead of uh, allowing this expansion to actually further restrict infilling. I propose that there would be less of an impact on the infrastructure, the streets and such, uh, by allowing adding a house here and there rather than massive developments. I propose that infilling should be encouraged uh, as a method to make, to make less impact on our road structures. Uh, I propose that the increase of your cap may be insufficient and perhaps should be removed altogether. For the individual long-term owner, 
I propose that there be no cap on restricting my subdividing. I am concerned that the county may inc impose an increase in the fees incumbent upon me in making a subdivision to make it actually onerous for me to be able to do this and take advantage of my current right. Uh, I'll finish this up. With Thank I, you, sir. I feel it would be most unfair to restrict uh, and take away my right to develop. Thank you, Thank sir. you. Have a good evening. And then uh, uh, Laura Wisely. Hi, um, thank you. My name is Laura Wisely, and um, I live at 5811 Main Street in Elk Ridge. I am a mother of three children who attend Elk Ridge Elementary School in Elk Ridge. I'm asking to change APFO in accordance with the Howard County Board of Education requirements. I also feel adjustments need to be made to the fees imparted on developers, as well as delays in development that make sense and keep the community best interest in mind. APO affects my family's quality of life at school and in the community. Elkridge Elementary has 900 students and counting. Our capacity at the end of last school year was 118%, and it is continuing to grow as students keep enrolling. More teachers have been hired this year, and we were told to expect teachers to still be hired within this semester due to a large influx of last minute enrollment and class sizes. I was a bit nauseous when I saw my son's, my third grade son's school photo last year to see how many children are actually in that class when you actually see it in person. When my child has had to have been, when you have that group of students with a variety of, so when you have that group of students and we've had to evacuate the classroom many a times because of just the way it's being managed. Children are taught in portables and makeshift spaces are being turned into classrooms. As an avid PTA volunteer, we as a PTA try to inject a sense of community, service, and fun into our children. Our events get larger and larger each year, and yet there have been some events that have had to be canceled or modified since we cannot fit into our cafeteria and our large spaces safely. We have a sign in our cafeteria of what our capacity is, and we can't even have there enough families there to host these events because we have 900 children in our school. When I think of Howard County, I think of progressiveness. Our education system thrives in our state and even amongst our nation. However, in the case of APFO, I don't think it fits the philosophy. I live in the Route 1 corridor, and I feel like Elkridge is, is decaying despite the new construction of homes. The reason it feels this way is because the community amenities are not keeping up with the loads of new multi-tenant structures being built. The effects in my community feels like someone overspending with a credit card living outside of our means. When you live outside of your means, life gets messy. It leads to chronic stress, lapses in safety, and inability to focus on the values. I'm going to speed up. Um, Sorry, you're going to run out of time. In a I know, minute, in a I'm going to run here. out of time. We have, we have your, your testimony here in, in, in writing as well, so the, the, the full uh, text of it. So appreciate that. Any, any questions, colleagues? Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you. I appreciate that you stuck in there for uh, to be our last uh, person testifying tonight. <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, so as I had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we're going to uh, pick back up on uh, the the 18th, September 18th, as I mentioned, the public hearing will start uh, at 6 p.m., but we will plan to start this as close to 7 o'clock uh, as possible as we wrap up our, uh, wrap up our session uh, for the, 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 test, the uh, legislation before us. Thank you. No, the list that, that if you signed up, the, that list we're just going to carry forward. So it will be in the same order uh, as people. Thank you for that question, and that's the clarification, yes. So thank you very much, folks. Have a good evening.
we have a long evening before us. This is a continuation from the July Legislative Public Hearing of the County Council. Please silence all electronic equipment at this time, including us colleagues. Um, we're going to open our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we have tonight with us uh, a couple of scouts from Troop 007, Glenwood, Maryland, St. Andrews Church, Jaden Hodge and Adam Stewart. Gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind coming front and center. There you go. This is a special continuation of the public hearing which was held on July 17, 2017. We do have a long evening ahead of us. And before we begin hearing testimony, I need to go over some important information for the evening. Uh, if you are joining us here in the Bannerker Room, please have a seat. So we do have a, oh, the only people who should be standing are either our staff. Uh, we have a couple of police officers here as usual. Uh, so if you are uh, not our staff or a member of the police force, you need to be seating seated uh, because the fire department doesn't allow any standing in our in our aisle. So uh, so if there's uh, anybody has a seat empty next to them, just a couple of people, raise your hand if you have empty seats near you. Great. Okay, there's plenty of seats. So if, uh, if you're looking for one, uh, you can have a seat there. So as I said, uh, according to the fire marshal, no standing is allowed. If the room fills and you cannot find an open seat in the Bannock room, overflow seating is available down the hall. That's to my left. Uh, to your left when you walk out the room uh, in the C. Vernon Gray Room. The hearing is being broadcast there, so you'll be able to watch until your name is called uh, as your turn to testify approaches. The hearing will also be broadcast in the lobby. To make it easier for people to find open seats, uh, I just did that so you don't have to do it again <laughs> in terms of looking to your left. Uh, it would be better if you have a, uh, an open seat toward the middle that people squeeze in so that... Uh, so that people can come in and just sit on the ends of the rows. Uh, at the request of the fire marshal, I want to also take this opportunity to point out the emergency exits. This is my uh, version of a uh, flight attendant. Uh, so we have emergency exits in the back where you came in. Uh, and then we do have one here to the side. Uh, it's the door that's not marked, this is not an exit. So pretty obvious which one it is. Uh, that one will just lead you right out uh, to uh, outside directly. Uh, if, uh, if we need to uh, exit the room in an emergency. Um, for, uh, for our hearing this evening, when I call each person to testify, we'll also call the next uh, three names of people who are signed up to testify. You'll note that in the front row here, uh, we have seats directly behind the testimony podium that's reserved uh, for on deck, if you will. Those are the people who are about to testify, uh, and we'd ask that you move up and sit there while you're waiting your turn. Uh, it'll make things go a little bit smoother for this evening. As soon as you hear your name called in the list of the next three people to testify, please come forward and wait in this front row. We've got quite a few people who wish to testify this evening, and we want to keep the hearing moving as efficiently as possible. And so when, you hear, when your turn comes to testify, you should be waiting in the front row, ready to come forward to the podium. If you miss your turn to testify, you will not be called again until the end of the, end of the hearing. When you are called to testify, please give your name and address for the record when you're seated at the podium. If you're the only speaker representing an organization, please identify that organization before you begin. Speakers who are the only representative from an organization will have up to five minutes to speak. All others have up to three minutes. You may not yield your time to another speaker or to a presentation. These are the maximum time limits for your testimony. However, brevity is appreciated. Uh, and if, you have a, if a previous speaker has adequately expressed your opinions, please feel free to simply let the council know your position in support of or opposition to the legislation. The timer will make an audible sound when your time is up. I apologize in advance uh, because I'm going to be direct tonight and asking you to complete your testimony when your time is up. Please finish your sentence and respect others who are waiting to speak. If you have written testimony, Please give it to our administrator, uh, Jessica Feldmark, sitting right up here, for distribution and for the record. If you wish to testify at this hearing, please sign up. Many of you have already signed up. 
online or may have signed up in the lobby when you arrived. If you have not yet signed up, uh, you may do so uh, through our electronic system uh, that's in the, on the laptop right outside. Uh, and if you have any questions on how to do that, a member of our staff will be available if you, have, if you need assistance. And our staff member tonight is Mr. Wemberley. He's right here. So if you are having issues, please let Mr. Wemberley know. Our on-site electric si electronic sign-up will be closing at 6.30 this evening, so in about 20 minutes. Please note that you must sign in by 6.30 if you wish to be called to testify. If you have not signed up by 6.30, it does not mean that you won't be able to testify. However, you won't have a chance to testify until after we've heard from everyone who has signed up for either agenda item. So if you plan to testify but have not yet signed up to do so, we strongly encourage you to do so now. After the sign-up is closed, we will be posting a list of names of all those signed up to testify on each agenda item so that you can see where you are in the list. That list will be posted just outside the Banneker room next to each entrance. We do expect tonight's hearing to, to run late, likely until midnight, uh, and we understand that some of you may have schedule constraints that will not allow you to wait until you're, you are called. If you are not able to stay to deliver your testimony in person, you may email your testimony to the full council by sending it to councilmail at howardcountymd.gov. That email address is also posted outside the room by the sign-up table. As tonight's hearing will be long, uh, we, do not, we do plan to take short breaks every couple of hours, both to reset our recording equipment and to refresh ourselves. Uh, in addition, as the night goes on, you may see some council members simply stand in our place to stretch your legs and backs. Uh, if you're in the audience and need to take a similar stretch break, we ask that you please step out into the lobby so that you do not distract or block the view of anyone else in the audience, and also because the fire marshal has requested that nobody stand in the aisles. Since tonight's hearing uh, will be quite long, you may also find yourself getting hungry. I feel like I'm a, an advertisement here. So we, have, we are not selling snacks here. It's not a moneymaker. But there is a snack machine outside along with a uh, soda machine. Uh, you can uh, go out there, get them, but you have to consume them out there. Uh, those things are not allowed uh, in the uh, Bannock Room or in the C. Vernon Gray Room. Restrooms are down the hall to the left. Uh, and uh, uh, just before you reach the, the double glass doors for the council office. Should you need to, leave, need to leave the Bannock Room for any reason, please take your belongings with you. Uh, you may not save seats. If the Bannock Room is at its full capacity when you leave the room, someone else may be let in to take your seat. Items left in unoccupied seats will be removed in order to open the seat for someone else. Our final announcement before we get started, if you have a sign, uh, it must be small enough to fit in front of you or uh, in your seat. Signs may not be raised or waved or handled in any way that disrupts the hearing or interface, interferes with others' ability to observe the proceedings. If you have a sign that is too large to hold on your lap and fit between the armrests of your seat, please place it on the floor under your chair or remove it from the room. Um, uh, one, other, one other note, folks, if we can, uh, I know the, the topics that we have before us tonight have raised some passion uh, amongst the folks here in the room and around the community. I ask that we try and maintain some decorum while we're here in the room so, again, everybody has an opportunity to, to speak. If we have interruptions for applause, yelling, or what have you, it will just delay our proceedings, and people at the end of the proceeding will not be able to, uh, we, we not be able to, to speak tonight. Uh, and uh, if we hit what I'll be doing as well, when we get to, um, when we get to uh, uh, later in the evening around 11, 11.15, 11, uh, I will... Uh, We'll take a quick look to see how, how we're doing, but uh, the plan is to stop at midnight. And for those folks who would uh, appear after midnight, you'll be invited to come back on the 18th, a week from today, uh, and, and to testify at the end of that evening's uh, public hearing after all the other legislation that's before us is heard. Um, and so now we're ready to begin, believe it or not. And uh, because this is a school night, and I think we have some students here that might want to testify, uh, and we expect to run late, uh, we'll be giving any uh, K through 12 students who have signed up to testify a chance to speak at the beginning of the evening. Okay, so, uh, so that, with that, I will first after ask if there are any students who have signed up to testify on Council Bill 60. Uh, any K through 12 students who have signed up to testify on, on compost and natural wood waste recycling? Okay, do I have any students who have signed up for Again, K-12 students. Do not see any hands. I see a hand over there. Yes. Okay. Very good. So come on over. 
Uh, anybody else, if you have, if you are a, a K through 12 student and have signed up to testify on the compost and natural wood waste recycling uh, 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 legislation, then just come, come and have a seat in the reserve section. Come on down. If, it's, if, you're, if you're doing AFL, we're going to do that next. First, I'm just calling folks who are testifying, uh, K through 12 students. Yes, if you're, are you testifying on, on the mulchin? No, no, no she's, just, she's just saying she should go ahead and head that direction. You can head in that direction anyway, yes. Just have a seat in the reserve section. The reserve seat, right? Yes. Okay. So it doesn't appear we have anybody for the wood mulch. Right, right here, right behind the podium. See where there you go. reserve, you got it. Go ahead. It's all good. Don't there you go. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. The whole community is helping out. There you go. Excellent. Um, okay. And any other students, K through 12, then, so hearing none for, uh, for uh, Council Bill 60, uh, if you are a, a student uh, and are interested in testifying or have signed up to testify 61 and 62 on AFO legislation, uh, please raise your hand. Other students, K-12, just go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat uh, right over there where uh, the signs are on the chairs. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, so in no particular order, since you were the first to stand up, why don't you, you come, come on up. Make sure you give us your name so we can uh, identify that you've testified on the list.